uh, brief opening remarks. Members will receive uh, testimony from the witnesses today, and then the hearing will be open to our members' questions. Members will be recognized in the order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in the order of arrival for those members who have joined us after the hearing was called to order. And when you are recognized, you will be asked to please unmute your microphone and you will have five minutes to ask your question and make your statements. And if you are not speaking, please, I ask that you remain muted in order to minimize the background noise so, so we can hear what our witnesses and our members are saying. And in order to get to all of your questions, the timer will stay consistently visible on your screen and your chairman is going to be very strict. Five minutes, the hammer's coming down. We want everybody to participate in this extraordinary event. And, and ladies and gentlemen, my opening statement, this is an historic hearing. And I want to begin this hearing with these words, we all know that all things work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to God's purpose. There could be no more glorious words to use to set off this historic hearing that we are having today. And we all are very pleased to have the opportunity today to examine this topic which is deeply embedded in each of our hearts, both Democrats and Republicans, care about the plight of our Black farmers. And when our minds and our hearts are together, we are truly doing God's will. And so, as always, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to work on this issue alongside my colleague, the Republican ranking member of this committee, and my friend, Congressman Thompson of Pennsylvania. And I want to thank our Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, for appearing before our committee today. And this is our first um, committee conversation with our second uh, tenure of the USDA, uh, Mr. Secretary, and we are so delighted and glad that you are before us today. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for joining us today. I have the, I, I um, have heard that uh, you are extremely busy. And I want to just doubly appreciate your time that you're taking to speak with us on this important and historic issue. 
an issue that I know that you have been working on. And I thank you for the work that we have done together in putting forward a helping hand in the rescue package to bring $4 million to help our farmers pay their loans and the $1 million that will help provide technical soap. We appreciate you working with us on that. For decades, the discrimination against black farmers by the United States Department of Agriculture has been well documented. Reports by the United States Commission on Civil Rights, the Government Accountability Office, and even the United States Department of Agriculture itself describes the discriminatory practices uh, that in, were enabled by laws dating back all the way to the 1930s. That's why I'm saying this is historic. And, and hallowed ground that we are working on this day. In fact, in 1997, a group of black farmers, including Mr. Timothy Pickford, filed a class action lawsuit against the United States Department of Agriculture over the agency's discrimination against black farmers in uh, farm loan programs and other benefit programs, as well as over the agency's failure to investigate racial discrimination complaints, complaints. The evidence is in, it is before us today, and this is why this is so meaning for us and why I prefaced it with, that message from the Lord that he has given to us this day to serve his purpose that he has brought us together today. And that is to bring justice to our black farmers. Well, the United States Department of Agriculture settled this class action lawsuit and as a part of that settlement, some black farmers, just some, received $50,000. Now, many of my house colleagues may think that $50,000 is indeed a lot of money. But when a new tractor costs as much as a half of a million dollars, $50 is barely enough for down payment on a reasonably good use tractor. So it isn't enough to make improvements to the land. It's, it, it's going to even, it may not even be enough to finance next year's mortgages of seed and fertilizer. And in my frank opinion, $50,000 is not enough to make up for the decades of discrimination and generational wealth that has been lost among black farming families, losing the land and the livelihood of our black families. Black farms are by and large black family farms. And further, adding insult to injury, Black farmers were saddled with IRS tax bills from that Pickford settlement, leaving many of them worse off than before they even got the 50000 And that's why what we did together in the bill we just passed, when people say, what is this in here? talking about paying the tax bill. 
It's because we love from the pit of it. So there's money here that takes into consideration up to 20% over what we're getting so that those taxes are paid for because the IRS uses that money as income and they tax the loan forgiveness. So I think, and I want to thank Secretary Vilsa for helping us put that package together. So in short, the Pickford settlement was too little. It was too late for our black farmers who lost their farms and livelihoods due to longstanding systemic discrimination and this dissemic, dis, systemic discrimination continues to be felt by black farmers right today who are still disadvantaged in our United States Department of Agriculture programs. This festering wound on the soul of American agriculture must be healed. This isn't just a festering wound in the black farming area. It's a festering wound on all of agriculture because we've got to excise and heal this wound so that once and for all, my fellow members, we will be able to make the statement that we no longer have racial discrimination in our United States Department of Agriculture and that we want our glorious and wonderful world of agriculture to be open, to have opportunities for everybody, regardless of race, breed, or color. And that is why I have repeatedly called for a new conversation between black farmers and the United States Department of Agriculture. And this hearing is an opportunity for us together with Secretary Bilson here joining us to begin that conversation examine the Secretary of Agriculture's ideas and reforms that I understand he is already working on. And we have this opportunity to hear firsthand from our Secretary. And I thank God for that. This hearing is uh, today is very public. And it's a public way to address the deep mistrust that many of our farmers of color feel towards the United States Department of Agriculture. We're not hiding anything here because when you hide it, you can't solve it. This is why this hearing is historic. And to make uh, sure, that in an increasingly competitive agriculture economy, no talent or ability is ignored or left behind. We are no longer can afford that approach. The black farmer representatives who are here today with us today, they will discuss this longstanding systemic discrimination against our black farmers who better to do that than our black farmers themselves? And that's why I'm so glad that they are here along with Secretary Bill Sack. In 1920, black farm operators were 14% of all the United States farmers. And in the South, they were over 20% of all the farms were owned by African Americans. You know what it is now? It's less than 2%, 1.8% 1 
to be exact. Lack of equal access to our federal farm loan programs is a large reason black farms have lost 90% of their land. In 1937, Congress required that local elected county commissioners and committees certify the eligibility of farmers for the farm loan program. And when a farmer applied for a farm program, the county committees received sensitive information about the applicants. This left credit worthiness up to the elected officials, county officials on the committee. Many of them were landlords on this land. Talk about a conflict of interest in addition to the racism. So there was built in bias against our black farmers for decades. And I'm not speaking to you as one that don't know. You're looking at your chairman who was born on a black farm, my grandparents farm in Ainer, South Carolina. And you talk about farming, that was the heart of it in Ainer. I know what it was there. For those of you who feel the number of loans to fairly, uh, is fairly representative of the number of black farmers today, I say they totally missed the point. Most farmers who can't get a loan are simply not farming. But we are here to find out why they aren't farming to examine the built-in barriers to the loan system and to see how to remove them. We have six farmers and farmer advocates here on the panel with us today who will share their experience and solutions to address the effects of discrimination and improve the profitability and the sane of of sustainability of our black farm. That is the bottom line. We've got to increase the market share of our black farmers. So if we do that and our black farmers are making money, we will never have to be in the position of having to pay lending bills if they get the proper amount of market share to sell their products on the market. Folks are noticing our good work here in Congress as well. And I have a letter of support for policies included uh, the American Rescue Plan for Relief for Farmers of Color. If there's no objection, I will enter this letter of support from Bayer, a major agricultural industry giant there for the record. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome the distinguished ranking member, my friend, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Johnson, for his opening remarks. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon and thank you, Chairman. Always a privilege and honor to uh, uh, to work with you on the issues uh, that are so important to rural America and to our agriculture industry. And so, uh, and thank you for holding today's hearing on such an important issue that I, I know is not only near and dear to your heart, but it's an issue of such importance that each and every one of us participating today, including those tuning in to our live stream, can, can learn something from. Uh, today's hearing to review the state of black farmers in the United States is an opportunity to address some questions that quite frankly have gone unanswered for far too long. Uh, everyone participating today is familiar with the 1999 class action suit, Pigford versus Glickman, a case that alleged decades of discrimination by the U.S. Department of Agriculture against black farmers applying for farm loans and other government assistance. And since the original Pigford settlement, more than $2 billion have been allocated as compensation for 
black farmers. Now, without a doubt, there's been discrimination at USDA in the past against black farmers and other socially disadvantaged groups. Um, sadly, I'm sure instances of discrimination remain today. Now, the American Rescue Plan was signed into law on, uh, two weeks ago today. Among the nearly $2 trillion in spending was $5 billion allocated for black farmers, $4 billion of which was designated for loan forgiveness. Now, let me be clear, I didn't vote for this bill for many obvious reasons. The fact that the bulk of the multi-trillion dollar bill had virtually nothing to do with COVID was chief among them. It was also drafted behind closed doors with no input from the minority party. We never get the best product whenever we allow, when either party allows that to happen. And moreover, the bill was drafted based on hypotheticals, misinformation, and incomplete data. Unfortunately, that's what happens when you force through partisan legislation through budget reconciliation. Uh, paying off the loans of socially disadvantaged farmers may help in the short term, but it does very little to address the root cause of this of this issue. And I know my uh, health care practice for 28 years, um, we had to get to the root cause of an issue to, to truly address it long term. I think that applies just as important lessons to apply to legislation uh, or dealing with public policy issues such as, especially as, as grievance, grievous ones as, as discrimination uh, with agriculture programs and the support of those. Um, it, uh, it does nothing to attack discrimination head on and it certainly doesn't prevent racial exclusion for black farmers or any other socially disadvantaged group in the future. Now, how did USDA leadership fail so spectacularly to allow this ongoing discrimination for so many years? Why were bad actors allowed to continue their comfortable government or appointed jobs when they so brazenly allowed discrimination to continue, even if not having directly engaged in discrimination itself? Where was the oversight? Where was the supervision of these bad actors? Is simply forgiving debt the best way to address this problem and provide a forward thinking and equitable outcome? The American Rescue Plan gives USDA blanket authority to handle the funds provided through the legislation. We're surely leaving an unelected bureaucracy with a decades long track record of racial discrimination to their own devices cannot be the best, way, the best way to right wrongs. We cannot forget the progress Congress has already made by authorizing programs and initiatives through previous farm bills. Uh, I'm very proud of to assist our black and other socially disadvantaged farmers. From credit to conservation, there have been a number of provisions that seek to address inequalities. For example, USDA's Farm Service Agency now targets direct loans and guarantees loans to eligible socially disadvantaged farmers to buy and to operate family-sized farms and ranches. And when it comes to conservation and forestry, the Natural Resource Conservation Service has made a concerted effort to provide resources for socially disadvantaged and historically underserved producers. Every year, NRCS targets 5% of its EQIP uh, investments, that program, for socially disadvantaged farmers. However, over the last decade, NRCS has exceeded expectations with 33% of EQIP funds funding going to historically underserved producers and beginning farmers. And of course, I'd be remiss not to mention the 2018 Farm Bill uh, and, and Clay Chairman recognize your efforts when it came to doing better and providing the investments in our historically black uh, 1890 land grant universities. Uh, thank you for your leadership on that initiative as a part of part of that farm bill process, including the $80 million in scholarships uh, uh, for those HBCU students to pursue agricultural education. And while much work remains, we should look to these these previous this previous progress as really a blueprint in continued in our continued discussions. We must work together as a farm team. Farmers, ranchers, producers, legislators, stakeholders, and activists alike to reduce barriers that are preventing black and other socially disadvantaged farmers from participating fully in a robust farm economy. 
uh, we must support a strong farm economy that lifts up all. Now, I'd like to thank our chairman once again. And I would especially like to thank our witnesses. We have an impressive list of witnesses here having uh, read and digested your uh, your written uh, testimony. It uh, just, uh, uh, it was certainly heartfelt. Uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, passion, emotion, uh, sharing your life stories throughout that. Um, and and that's, that's appreciated, much appreciated. Uh, your testimony is critical in helping us better understand the discrimination black farmers have faced. And it will also, it will play a crucial role to ensure our agriculture policy does not discriminate. Rather, it empowers farms of all races, sizes, and commodities. Now, I'm here to listen. We're all here to listen. And I look forward to participating in this long overdue conversation. Thank you, Chairman. And I yield back. Thank you, Thank Ranking you. Member, for those uh, excellent uh, comments and words. The chair would request that other members submit their operating opening statements for the record so witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for all of your questions. So without objection, the chair is authorized at any time to declare the committee in recess subject to the call of the chair. And now let us turn our attention to our distinguished uh, panelists who are here with us today, and uh, we're so delighted. First, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the Agriculture Committee, Secretary Tom Vilsack, who is now leading our Department of Agriculture for the second time. Secretary Vilsack needs no introduction to many of us on the, this committee, but I will note <clears throat> that he did serve two terms also as the governor of Iowa before joining the Obama administration <clears throat> as the 30th secretary of agriculture in 2009. He was President Obama's longest serving cabinet secretary. He was confirmed again in February of this year um, for his second tenure as secretary. Our next witness is Mr. John Boyd, Jr., founder and president of the National Black Farmers Association. Mr. Boyd is a fourth generation farmer from Bakersville, Virginia where he owns and operates a 300 acre farm, raising corn, wheat, soybeans, and beef cattle. Mr. Boyd is a familiar presence here in Washington, D.C. as the founder and president of the National Black Farmers Association. Since 1995, the National Black Farmers Association has fought hard for equal treatment for our black farmers at USDA's Farm Service Agency, particularly with equal access to credit. Also, Mr. Boyd was a key spokesperson for black farmers during both Pickford one and Pickford two. And Mr. Boyd continues to promote uh, inclusion, equality of opportunity for black farmers across all sectors of our agriculture industry across the nation. It's good to have you here today, Mr. Boyd and we appreciate your testimony as well. And now I'm pleased to welcome our third witness, Mr. Cornelius Blanning, Executive Director of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Mr. Blanning joins us today with a deep background in management consulting and business development, including 24 years in support of black farmers and rural 
landowners. <laughs> he has served on more boards and committees than exactly we have time to name here today. Of note, though, our USDA's advisory committee on beginning farmers and ranchers, as well as a member of the advisory board of the socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers policy research center. We are very grateful for your time, your experience, and your commitment to black farmers. And thank you also for joining us today. Our fourth witness is Mr. Philip Haney, the third, Philip J. Haney, the third. He is chairman of the <clears throat> National Black Growers Council. Mr. Haney is a fifth generation farmer based in Reedsville, Virginia, where he and his family have a grain farm, a timber harvesting operation a bulk transport business, in addition to a, a landscaping and excavating company. He's a graduate of Virginia Tech. Mr. Haney is currently the chairman of the National Black Growers Council. Welcome, Mr. Haney. You are clearly a very busy man. Mr. Haney, we appreciate your participation for being here today and look forward to your excellent testimony. Next, I'd like to welcome Mr. Cedric Rowe. Mr. Rowe is an organic, organic farmer from Rowe Organic Farm. Mr. Rowe is from Albany, Georgia, where he operates a U.S. DA certified organic farm producing peanuts, hemp, watermelons, and canofa, canola, excuse me, canola. His commitment to agriculture extends from um, creation of the first Georgia Organic Peanut Association his pursuit of a PhD in soil health, that's gonna come in very handy as we grapple with our climate change, no-till farming and cover crops. And his commitment uh, to rural Georgia is evident by his work with young farmers in his community. And as a recognized leader of young farmers, he is an example of hard work and brains. And I hear he knows how to play football too. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Rowe. Our fifth witness is Mrs. Shirley Sharon, an extraordinary individual and a legendary leader in the fight to help our black farmers. Ms. Shirley Sherrod is executive director of the Southwest Georgia Project for Community Education Incorporated. Mrs. Sherrod is a distinguished fellow Georgian who has served in multiple positions promoting rural communities and agriculture. Mr. Mrs. Gerard is a graduate of Albany State in Albany, Georgia, and Mrs. Gerard was the first person of color to be appointed as Georgia State Director of the United States Department of Agriculture's Rural Development in 2009. And I'm really looking forward to as we move to really address rural development and rural broadband. Mrs. Sherrard uh, brings years of cumulative expertise to today's panel of witnesses as a founder and vice president of development for New Communities, Inc., the nation's first community land trust, the executive director 
of Southwest Georgia's project for community education aid, as well as the state lead for Southern Rural Black Women's Initiatives for Economic and Social Justice. Thank you so very much for sharing your wealth of experience and knowledge with us today, Mrs. Sorrell. And to introduce our final witness, I am pleased now to yield to our colleague on the Agriculture Committee, the distinguished gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Mann. Uh, thank you, Chairman Scott, and thank you for this hearing. I'm honored to introduce to you Arnetta and Eric Cotton, the owners of Kingdom Community Development Services and Cattle for the Kingdom in Wagner, Oklahoma. The Cottons have more than 54 years of farm and ranch experience and have dedicated their lives to outreach and assistance for rural and underserved communities. I'm especially grateful for the Cottons and their recent work to distribute USDA farmers to families food boxes in Kansas, among other states, and through the Rural Impact Food Pantry at the church that they lead. I have very much enjoyed getting to know the Cottons. They're wonderful people. They're the perfect example of serving educating and finding ways to farm and ranch despite adversity. Mr. and Mrs. Cotton, we look forward to hearing your testimony in a few minutes. Thank the gentleman uh, for his remarks and for his introduction. Now we will now proceed to our historic hearing and uh, uh, with our testimony. And each of our panelists will have five minutes. Now, I am going to be strict on the timer uh, so that we can get everybody in and heard. And so the timer will be visible to everyone on your monitors so that you will have a countdown to zero, at which point your time will be expired and I will bring down the gap. So now let us start with our distinguished chairman of the agriculture, uh, the United States Agriculture Department, uh, Mr. Vilsack, our distinguished secretary, you are now recognized for five minutes. Please begin. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, to you and to the ranking member Thompson for calling this historic hearing on the state of uh, black farmers in America and discrimination directed at black farmers by the Department of Agriculture. In the interest of time and my belief that the testimony of the other panelists on this panel is far more relevant and more compelling than anything I would offer, I won't read my prepared statement but would ask that it simply be placed in the record. What I wish to do today is to speak from the heart. And I want to provide you, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, a single and solemn commitment from me and from the team at USDA that we will, over the next four years, do everything we can to root out whatever systemic racism and barriers may exist at the Department of Agriculture directed at black farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers, and people who live in persistently poor areas in rural America. Efforts have already been made in the past, as you have indicated, Mr. Chairman, good faith efforts to respond to specific acts of discrimination, but more needs to be done to dig deeper into the systemic causes and barriers that perpetuate discriminatory practices and to deal directly with the cumulative effect of discrimination, the gap that now exists between those who had the full array of services at USDA the full array of programs at USDA, and those who for far too long have not had that array. Work has begun already to start with the implementation of President Biden's executive order on equity. A working group has been formed at USDA across all agencies, and they've already begun to meet and to begin the work of the assessment of services, benefits, contracts, and procurements, and barriers and problems that may exist We'll have the I, I will have the benefit of the guidance and direction for the first time ever of a senior advisor for equity in the secretary's office. Dr. Dwayne Goldman has been 
appointed in that position. And he will work with our new team at the Civil Rights Office and with the dedicated men and women at USDA to provide advice and direction on equity issues throughout the USDA. And I certainly look forward to the day of Senate confirmation of Dr. Jewel Bernard, who once confirmed will be the first African-American Deputy Secretary at the United States Department of Agriculture. She and I will partner together to carry out and fulfill the commitment that I made to you today. Finally, I'm grateful for your leadership, Mr. Chairman, and that of Chairman Bishop, Senators Booker, Warnock, and Warren, who helped to shepherd through the American Rescue Plan that contains an historic step forward in responding to the cumulative effect of discrimination in the past by providing debt relief for socially disadvantaged producers, by establishing an equity commission to review barriers that exist at USDA, to assist with heirs property issues, expanded outreach, market development, and land access. These resources will help restore some balance in the USDA covenant relief approach and allow an external review of all of our programs at USDA. We're prepared to move quickly, efficiently, and thoughtfully to implement the American Rescue Plan sections related to black farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers and other sections of the rescue plan that relate to rural America. As part of my commitment to you today, I also want to provide an additional guarantee, and that is I plan to have in place a system of rigorous reporting, accountability, and oversight in all of our equity efforts. Let me be clear, there is no place at the USDA for discrimination, none, nor for that matter, anywhere. This historic moment to advance equity must not be lost. And I intend to do everything I can to ensure that it isn't. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the questions from the committee at your pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much for your very good testimony that we have just heard. Now, I want to recognize for five minutes, our next panelist, Mr. Boyd. You are now recognized to begin. Mr. Boyd, you may be muted. Is he? There we go. I'm sorry. Is that okay, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Th thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to give honor to God first and foremost, and I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, the, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Thomas Thompson, Congressman Thompson, uh, uh, the other congressperson from North Carolina, the vice chair, Alma Adams, and I spent some time uh, visiting with uh, most members of the Agriculture Committee to, to talk to them about the plight of the black farmers uh, this week. So I would like to thank all of the members who took time to visit with me personally to talk about uh, the plight of the black farmers. It is an honor to be here today to talk to you and this committee. This is a, a hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I personally have been advocating for for over 30 years. And when I first began to advocate uh, and press the issue on Capitol Hill, we could never even get a full committee agriculture hearing. So the people who are watching here, this is a very, very historic hearing in nature, where the only hearing we could get at that time was with the Congressional Black Caucus in 1997, where all of the members participated and listened to uh, the plight of black farmers. On behalf of every enslaved black man in this country, on behalf of every sharecropper in this country, on behalf of every black farmer who tilled the soil, past and present, we thank you and this committee for finally hearing our cries. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a fourth generation farmer, a fourth generation farmer, and I was trained to farm by my grandfather, Thomas Ford, and my, also my other grandfather, Lee Robinson, a sharecropper, and my father, John Boyd Sr., uh, who's probably watching this hearing today. I have a long, rich history of farming along the Runoff River 
in Mecklenburg County, Virginia, where my great grandfather, Andrew Boyd, was a slave. Uh, so we bring a lot of history and wealth and pride and wisdom to this uh, committee, to, committee today as we reach out to talk to you. Uh, currently today, I raise corn, wheat, and soybeans, but I was trained as a tobacco, uh, cotton, and peanut farmer. Many of those things were bought out under the government buyouts, and I too switched over to, to those uh, type of commodities. Uh, today, as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, in your comments, we are less than 1% of the nation's farmers, and we are facing extinction. Uh, at the turn of the century, we are over 1 million black farm families strong, uh, tilling 20 million acres of land in this country. Today, we're down to 4.5 uh, million acres of land in this country and less than 50,000 uh, black farmers in this country. And we got to this place partly by the United States Department of Agriculture and its discrimination. And I can attest that discrimination was live and well at, at the Department of Agriculture, and we need to resolve the backlog of complaints that exist there. We need to impro improve program delivery at local offices around the country where those uh, farmers, even today, when they walk into the office and inquire about the Farmers of Color Act that recently passed, and we're getting a snabby and uh, disrespected type of tone from the local offices, uh, that they don't know anything about it and don't know how it's going to, to move forward. That was the same type of information that, that got us here in the first place, Mr. Chairman. So this committee worked hard to get that measure passed, and we need to, I'm urging the Secretary today, and I heard his comments, to move swiftly to move swiftly and implement uh, the bill so that the farmers can get the uh, debt relief. And also uh, the $29 billion that was told out in the Trump administration, uh, less than 0.01% went to black farmers. 0.1% out of the 29 billion uh, went to black farmers, Mr. Chairman. We can do better than that. And it was due to the act of discrimination. We're using the same program, the same policies uh, by rolling these uh, uh, information out through the county offices and it's failing because black farmers don't trust the United States Department of Agriculture. We have to find a better way uh, to do that. And that's why we named it, uh, Mr. Chairman, the last plantation and rightfully so. And today uh, we need to move in a more cohesive way. Uh, this isn't a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's happened on the uh, hands of all presidents and I met with uh, Sonny Perdue, uh, and it was the worst meeting in history for me as a, as a leader, where he said uh, black farmers had to get big or get out. He didn't need any tokens or people who didn't want to work on these committees. That's the type of discrimination that uh, black farmers are facing. And uh, it looks like I'm running out of my time, but I can talk to you, Mr. Chairman, about this all day long. I'm looking forward to getting all of the questions and input uh, from this uh, committee. And again, thank you for having this very, very important hearing. Thank you so much, Mr. Boyd, for your excellent uh, testimony. And next, um, we have Mr. Blanning. Please begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the committee. My name is Cornelius Blanding, and I'm the executive director of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund, a 54-year-old cooperative association of black farmers, landowners, and cooperatives from all across the South. Founded directly out of the Civil Rights Movement in 1967, the Federation is the oldest and largest black farmer-owned and serving institution in the country. It is also the only cooperatively owned organization of black farmers, landowners, and cooperatives focusing primarily on black land loss and the use of cooperatives as a tool to increase income and build wealth in the South, where 80% of all black farmers are located. I'm honored to be before this committee today, testifying on the realities, struggles, and perseverance of black farmers and landowners in the U.S. South. I've submitted my full statement to the committee, which I ask to be made part of the hearing record. As part of my brief opening statement, I would like to thank this committee again for this opportunity to testify before uh, on part of this historical hearing on black farmers. I have served the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and Black Farmers for the past 24 years and as the executive director of the Federation for the past six years. We, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, based on a study we did 41 years ago in 1980, uh, entitled The Impact 
am I lost? The impact of Ayers property on Blackwood land tenure in the southeastern region of the United States that was commissioned by Congress and funded by the United States Department of Agriculture and based on over 50 years of work. We estimate that approximately 60% of all black owned land is Ayers property. Land that lacks a clear title and that the landowner dies without a will or estate plan and is passed down informally to the heirs of deceased landowners. It is the reason that I and thousands of others in the black community are not black landowners or are still farming today. So you see this work is personal for me, just like it is for other folks on this uh, testifying on this hearing today, like it is for thousands of black farmers and advocates across this country. Heirs property is a civil rights issue. All the citizens of our country should have access to government services, but because of heirs property, many don't, and for decades, black farmers haven't, and this has resulted in black land loss. These are all things that could have been addressed with good and reasonable legislation. Including the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan recently passed by the Senate and the House and signed into law by the President. As I mentioned in my opening statement, Mr. Chairman, I'm here to testify on the realities, struggles, and perseverance of black farmers and landowners. The reality is that black farmers have gone out of business and lost the highest percentage of land in any other group in this country over the past century. In 1910, there were 218,000 black farmers owning roughly 15 million acres of land. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 1992, there were only 18,000 black farmers owning 2.3 million acres of land. That's over a 90% loss of black farmers as well as almost a 90% loss of black owned land. Another reality is that the majority of black farmers get their credit from USDA's Farm Service Agency, the lender of last resort, which they are expected to graduate out of their system in seven years. And after that, they're supposed to qualify for credit in a traditional market. However, that date never comes for most black farmers. Instead, they are relegated to a predatory style lenders at best and farming out of their pockets at worst. No business, especially farming, can survive in this. This the reality is also the black historically USDA, as shown in historical uh, lawsuit uh, paper versus Glickman. These realities have led to the struggles of black farmers, the struggles to hold on to land for generations because of unsecure or cloudy titles and discrimination. The realities of black farmers have also led to the struggle to successfully operate farms in a sector where they buy in a retail market and sell in a wholesale market, uh, primarily because of the lack of scale. 80% of black farmers operate on 100 acres or less. These realities have also led to the struggles to access enough fair and equitable credit uh, for farms to grow their business and become part time, beyond part-time subsistence farms. However, these struggles and realities have forced black farmers and landowners to be some of the most resilient people in their communities and, this, and in this country. Black farmers have persevered through the difficult days of sharecropping and the long nights of racism and discrimination and continue to persevere in spite of the issues of heirs' property, the lack of access to fair and equitable credit. Uh, but they, and they continue to be on the front lines of feeding families, anchoring rural communities, and protecting our environment, regardless of these realities and struggles. The black farmer story is of perseverance. It's about this story, and, uh, and it's about time this story is told. It's about time for a hearing such as this it's about our time for our country to support those that have given so much but received so little in exchange. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I reiterate the black farmer story is one of struggle and perseverance. And so I, I end with that, Mr. Chairman. But our, our air, our water, and our soil, and our lives depend on black farmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, for this opportunity to appear before you today. I stand ready for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your Excellent testimony. Mr. Haney, please begin now. Mr. Chairman, Secretary Vilsack, members of the committee, staff of the committee, and to the many others that have worked tirelessly in making this hearing possible, I would like to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Black farmers and landowners who have been asking, praying, and waiting so long for relief. I would also like to say thank you on behalf of the <clears throat> Black farmers who have passed on without personally being able to witness this day. Mr. Chairman, I come before you today on behalf of the National Black Growers Council, an organization that consists of multi-generational farmers who advocate for the interests of Black farmers in their local communities, in their states, and to the federal government. 
an organization whose mission is to improve the efficiency, productivity, and sustainability of black row crop farms. Mr. Chairman, I think we all know the statistics that 2% of the U.S. population are farmers and that black farmers represent less than 2% of the entire 100% of farmers in the United States. What I would like the committee to truly recognize is that black row crop farmers represent less than 8% of the entire black farm population. Mr. Chairman, black farmers that grow corn, cotton, soybeans, peanuts, and rice are on the verge of extinction. Mr. Chairman, it is imperative that we support the remaining black farmers that exist. It is imperative that we address the disparities and inequities that exist between black farmers and their white neighbors. And it is imperative that we put programs in place that remove the economic need that is on the neck of a lot of black farmers and landowners. As we at the National Black Growers Council have said before, land is a farmer's most valuable and productive asset. As you canvass the country, you will often find black farmers on non-irrigated land trying to compete with their white farmer neighbors who have used USDA programs to put irrigation on their land. You will also find black farmers who have not been able to participate in land leveling and drainage and other USDA programs to improve their farms like their white neighbors. These inequities place black farmers at a significant disadvantage to producing higher yields and being profitable. Mr. Chairman, on a trip to the local USDA office to inquire about a beginning farm alone, the county executive director brandished my father and I with a loaded handgun and told me that I did not need to get involved in farming and go get a job. My father, like many other black farmers across this nation, was a victim of discrimination by USDA. After settling his case for 25% of his economic losses, they barred him from ever borrowing money from USDA. These issues are discriminatory. And if not addressed, you and I will witness the extinction of black row crop farmers. In 2020, the world changed and we were and still are in what is called a pandemic. Unfortunately, black farmers have been going through a pandemic for years. We have watched our fellow black farmers be forced out of business and lose their land at far greater rates than our white neighbors. Mr. Chairman, the National Black Growers Council is committed to the cause and is working with our corporate partners, fellow farm advocacy groups, and the Department of Agriculture to reverse the declining trend of black farmers and landowners across these United States. Mr. Chairman, I was a college student in 1997 and watched my father, John Boyd, and other black farmers from across this nation sit before legislators and policymakers to explain these disparities that exist between black and white farmers. 24 years later, I am sitting before you echoing the same tones and explaining to lawmakers about the inequities that still exist. Too many black farmers have died with their cry for help falling on deaf ears. Mr. Chairman, I would hope and pray that my children do not have to sit at this table 24 years from now, still asking for you to right the wrongs on behalf of black farmers. Mr. Chairman, for all the people who have been working on policy and legislation to help right the wrongs of black farmers, I would like to leave them with these words of faith found in Galatians chapter six, verse nine. Let us not become weary of doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Haney, for your excellent, excellent report to us. And now I recognize Mr. Rowe, please begin your testimony. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to um, be on this call and be able to share my testimony. Um, my name is Sage Rowe, I'm a young farmer from South Georgia. Um, I do grow crop and I do also organic farming. Um, I'm a first generation of farmer. I've been farming for four years on my own. I had the opportunity to graduate from a land grant uh, institution that also taught me a little bit more about farming. Um, and you know, my experience of it is, is it has nothing has changed since the past. And um, hearing my granddaddy and older people talk about farming back in the day, 
and how they wasn't able to access um, land and equipment, I'm going through that personally myself. Um, I applied for um, beginner farmer program, microloans. Um, the reason I didn't get funded, I don't know. Um, I, I have legit reason why I need the assistance and not so the red flags are still there because I'm giving them all of my information, all of my life, just for them to tell me no again. So it, it, it holds it back. It holds me back as a, a farmer. So when you, um, I see the, the effort we're doing to allocate money for those programs, but are those programs actually funding these farmers, which they're not? Um, are these farmers taking advantage of those programs? We're not able to because when you look at a black farmer, you think it's small. That's why we're on that 1%, 2% level. Um, we, you know, we, you know, speaking from my personal experience, it's just been hard to, you know, even get into the market with peanuts. Um, as you know, peanuts is a commodity. And in order for you to grow peanut, a commodity, it sells itself. So as a black farmer, I can't just take my peanuts to any peanut mill because they'll say, oh, we're full. They'll give me some excuse of why they can't take my peanuts. So as a young farmer, you know, I created my own avenue um, to, to create my own market, organic peanuts, something that I know large farmers can't compete with. Um, that's why I tapped into another market like um, hemp. So I started doing more of organic, start focusing on the soil and the land, something that, you know, that we always focus on growing up, take care of the land, the land take care of you. So, you know, being coming from that era and having that mentality, you know, even my little small piece of land, it, it matters just like a, a larger farmer. And I see to this day how money is being allocated to help out you know, young and black farmers and social disadvantaged farmers, but you know that it, it comes with so much just for that farmer to access that money. You look on the other hand, and hand, you know, it's easy for them to access money. They're, they're, they'll tell you I qualify for it, but when I get there, it's a whole nother story. So we we need to change up, you know, uh, 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 you know how who qualifies and who doesn't. Um, you know, a lot of the black farmers miss out on opportunity to um you know keep the land in their in, in their family name so they're forced to go get a loan from from the government which would you know nine times ten bring them you know into more debt because everyone knows farmers are risk every year is not a profitable year you know so farmers like me will look you know in order for me to feel like the government is giving me the right assistance you know it's 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 funny how we have a pandemic and during the pandemic you have other banks and all that that have forgiveness on their loans but if, you know, government, USDA has ha had loans out allocated for these farmers, but you never gave them options to, for the forgiveness so their family can keep keep that land in their name. Um, you know, something to be able to show, you know, with forgiveness, you have to show what you're doing, show that, show how you, at this one step and how it how better you to the next step. So, you know, I, I feel like we need to take more steps and um, the people at the top need to focus more at the people at the bottom. And, you know, just to leave with a scenario that I, um, something that I used to always tell people, the important person in the in the building is the janitor. Um, we as black farmers are janitors. The top person that can be the principal or the president. If the president is out of tune with the janitor, he is not a good structure. So we need to make sure we build that structure from the top all the way bottom to the farmers. You know, the people that's allocating this money need to know exactly who's using it, why they're using it, who really needs it. And I think it's a it's a separation in between there because yeah it's it's a difference saying yeah we put money out there for you but when we're not able to access it you know it's more like saying well we put it there it's up to you to get it that's not a, that's that's not hope that's not you know that's not giving a farmer or a black farmer any hope to be able to continue to hold on to what they what they had in their family so you know that was just some personal you know stuff that I've been through that I can still see that hasn't changed within the system. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rowe, for your very good and very informative hearing. Uh, thank you. And now, uh, Mrs. Sherrard, we recognize you. Please begin now. I grew up on, I, oops, 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 sorry. Oh, God, we hear you now. You hear me now? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chairman Scott. Can you hear? Okay, and the committee for inviting me 
to speak today. I grew up on a farm and my life's work has been with farmers and people in rural communities in the South. On a more personal note though, today, March 25th, marks the 56th anniversary of the death of my father, a farmer who was murdered by a white farmer that the racist system failed to prosecute. It is within this context that I dedicated my life to help make this world more just and equitable for everyone. For over five decades, I've worked with and on behalf of farmers, especially black farmers and, rural community, and the rural communities in which they live. Although black farmers share many of the problems faced by all small farmers, their situation is compounded by systemic racism within the USDA and other public and private institutions that are, that are supposed to serve all farmers, no matter their race or gender. The USDA is assumed to be the source of last resort when the private sector falls short. Unfortunately, it's incept since its inception, USDA itself has fallen short and failed to meet its obligations to black farmers. Regrettably, the USDA has been the driving force behind the steady decline. Poor health outcomes and brain drain, among other things. Now, the USDA did admit in the Pickford case that it has a history of discrimination against Black farmers. That admission and subsequent settlement did not bring about any systemic changes and left in place many of the individuals who perpetrated the racism and discrimination. In fact, to my knowledge, I, a black woman, am the only person ever fired by the USDA for discrimination, a claim that was later disproven. Although Pickford itself was historic and exposed the real USDA, Unfortunately, because the government was so incalcitrant, over 90% of the farmers who prevailed in the lawsuit were not made whole. So where do we go from here? Um, we need to restore Section 2501. This policy was the brainchild of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives nearly three, three decades ago. I was a staff member of the Federation and therefore very familiar with all the work and documentation that led to its passing as a permanent part of the Farm Bill. Its original intent was to provide farmers of color, especially black farmers, with outreach and technical assistance so that they could better access USDA services. The second one, eliminate burdensome matching requirements. Many USDA programs require a match that is out of reach for most black farmers. This is akin to a poll tax. It keeps the benefit out of our hands. Three, engage in real problem solving. Use the Georgia Strike Force example as a model, model and fully fund it. Invest in 1890s. 1890 universities are key black farmers, are key to black farmers' success. Ensure that they are funded equi equitably, let's say. Launch infrastructure fund. Provide funds for black farmers to develop or improve processing facilities, secure transportation, organize cooperatives, and more. Diversify the staff, moderate mandate increasing diversity in USDA staff makeup. And lastly, culture change. Staff culture flows from the culture of the leaders. Secretary Vilsack should invest significant time and effort into building a culture in which discrimination is not tolerated and is with the end in which dismantling of systemic racism is rewarded. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. These are but a few things that we can begin to put in place today while we wait on the fate of policies currently under consideration. 
we must also understand that even if these policies are approved, they only represent a down payment on what is owed to black farmers and their communities after more than a century of neglect and discrimination. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Sherrard. We're learning so much here and uh, purpose of this hearing is we're putting together a bill, a piece of legislation to address and come out. And so rest assured that your testimony, your ideas will not be, are not in vain because we're putting together black uh, farmers and a piece of legislation to bring this. So this is just the beginning. Thank you all so very much. And now we have I believe Miss Cotton. Mrs. Cotton, would you begin your testimony? Miss Cotton, you may want to unmute. Chairman Scott? Yes. Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, and distinguished members of the committee, we would like to begin. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. We can hear and see you. Okay, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, and distinguished members of the committee, we would like to begin by thanking you and God for the privilege and honor of testifying in this hearing. It is our hope that something said or done will result in greater understanding, reconciliation, and change. Thank you, Representative Tracy Mann, for our introduction. Little children across the United States who grew up watching their parents passionately work the land through torrential rains, incessant droughts, troublesome pestilence, and extreme poverty were often consumed by the idea that one day this land will be mine. Somewhere between working behind the plow for several hours at a time in the blazing sun for days on end to get the crops in and out, and the rare opportunities to reward themselves with a soda or an ice cream, they developed an insatiable obsession with nature. However, to be black and possess that type of intensity towards the earth in the United States, States as a young age can accurately be compared to someone laboring under the sweltering sun in a desert towards something that appears to be real. Over time, as the mirage steadily relocates, the child matures to adulthood. What remains is a diminutive essence of potential. Yet, despite years of imagining, the slightest sense of possibility is all that is required to stimulate hope in the, whole, in the heart of a Black farmer. We felt that hope. So when at the age of 24 and married less than five years with two baby girls, we were advised that the then FMHA was an agency that existed to assist young and beginning farmers, especially minorities. We thought we would be welcomed with open arms. Instead, when we stepped into our county FMHA office in 1984, the secretary looked up and continued working without ever acknowledging our presence. Ma'am, is this the FMHA we asked? Yes, she answered, never moving from her desk. An unwelcoming aura and overwhelming strangeness filled the room. Without a, ever a word spoken, its presence seems to demand that we simply turn around and leave, but we didn't. The county supervisor's tenure could not be denied, but neither could his unorthodox practices and forgetfulness. We had meetings at his home. Our file was lost and misplaced several times. Some years later, our initial contract Transit contact transitioned out of his role, and we were buried under the transition of powers. For example, on several occasions, the FMHA contractor and Langston University representatives reworked our farm plan on the same application, and they concluded we had good records, our cattle were in excellent condition, and that with an average production and some non-farm income, the plan was feasible. Yet despite their findings, the county committee rebutted that they were not comfortable with our ability, that the entire application should be changed. And since we could not effectively explain the rework plan, we could not possibly implement them with any degree of success. All of our alternative plans were repeatedly denied, but no viable plan for success was ever offered. Were it not for the elders who had a keen eye for identifying those whose work ethics and moral compass and instinctive cunning were perfectly suited for the land, um, they would have become extinct. Thankfully, one such elder offered her wisdom and trust to us. So we appealed the decision of the county supervisor. We, we appealed and the decision was overturned. 
But despite it overturning it, the FSA office said, maybe we should go ahead and let the applicant know uh, that further information is needed. So the county supervisor told us that we needed to get our property, property appraised and he selected the appraisal. Uh, coincidentally, that appraisal appraiser appraised our property for less than it was valued for a year earlier. And despite winning our appeal, we lost the denial of our application. It was not our county office who told us about the designation and how language was expressly written to extend help to socially disadvantaged people. A friend helped us to navigate through this system. And we went to RS USDA in Washington, DC and met with several officials. These consultations resulted in our first community meeting. There were over a hundred people there in four inches of rain. We partnered with Langston University. Let me, let me just skip down to this, if you would, please, Chairman. One of the reasons that local churches and faith-based organizations are the backbone in communities and the F2F programs is because people trust them. We serve from hearts of love with boots on the ground. It is the I same spirit that we really, yeah. we humbly ask this committee I'm sorry. Uh, um, Let me say this. Please. May I please? May I say this? Yes, Just I'm, as we I'm have faith to... in God, who created one race of people, the human race, and who created the earth, the one on which we exist together, and the heavens, the ones that we continue to explore, we believe that he gave us the ability in him to equitably dwell together in peace, harmony, and love to preserve this beautiful land. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I tell you what fantastic and very informative and very impressive uh, testimony that we have heard from our distinguished panelists, uh, all of our black farmers here. It's been tremendous and very helpful and from our secretary as well. And now we are going to now proceed to getting questions from us members. Um, and I'm going to start then the ranking member, and then we're going to go with each of our member, uh, members on the committee alternating between Democrats and Republicans. Um, um, and, and first of all, let me start with this question, if I may. Um, and I recognize myself for five minutes, and I'll be held to that to be sure to set the proper example. I hope everybody heard me there. Um, Secretary Vilsack, again, let me thank you for coming, but I want to, you to it clear up for us. Um, we have, yes, we have, uh, can you hear me, uh, Secretary? Yes, sir. Good. We have just passed uh, the Rescue Act in which we had a total of right at $5 billion to get to our black farmers. Um, first of all, $4 billion of it was for the loan forgiveness. Now tell me, how? what are the instructions for how our farmers can make sure they at, get access to that money. How long will it take? And will there be some cumbersome bureaucracy in the way of them getting it? First of all, second of all, is it true that this money for the loan forgiveness that our black farmers will be getting will be subject to taxation? that the IRS will count it as income, and then they got another bill to pay. Clear up the entire disposition, and let's get it plain how we can make sure that this big hit we're giving to help our farmers get right to them quickly, immediately. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the instructions first and foremost is to do this as quickly as thoughtfully and carefully as possible. Two types of loans we're dealing with, direct loans and guaranteed loans. Let me deal with the direct loans first. 
uh, to the extent uh, that it's a relatively simple, straightforward loan, we're going to try to get this these done sort of in a tiered circumstance and situation as quickly as possible. 120%, basically, the loan gets paid off, 20% goes to the farmer. Now, farmers are going to have to think about this because to your question oh, on taxation. Oh, wait just a minute. You say of the amount, 20% goes to the farm? 20% goes to the farmer for the purpose of paying the tax. Good. Thank you. And the, But farmers need to think about this, uh, Mr. Chairman, because depending upon the size of the loan, the tax issue may be so that you may want to divide uh, potentially the forgiveness of the loan over more than one tax year in order to minimize your tax uh, liability. That's why it's going to be necessary for us to use a portion of the money from Section 1006 to provide outreach, technical assistance, and advice so that people can make the best decision for their farm so they don't find themselves in a deeper hole when this is all said and done. On the guaranteed loan side, remember, we're dealing with banks uh, where we have essentially guaranteed the loan. Uh, and we have sent a letter today uh, to those banks basically uh, indicating that they are to take no further action whatsoever to enforce, uh, to, to uh, uh, foreclose on, the, on farmers, that we are going to work with them to get these loans paid off. Now, uh, a, a question is going to come up if there is a prepayment penalty. Uh, there may be a prepayment penalty in that loan. We're going to ask for documentation of that prepayment uh, uh, penalty, and we're going to try to figure out how to deal with that. I don't have an answer today. I just know that it's an issue that we're going to have to confront and think about. And some of these guaranteed loans have themselves been sold by the banks, which makes a, a bit of a complication. Uh, but at the end of the day, this whole purpose is to try to get this done as quickly as possible, as effectively as possible, and to provide uh, farmers enough information and outreach so they can make informed decisions about their direct loan and the tax implications, and we can settle up their guaranteed loan without any further disruption. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, Mr. Secretary, how much of your time personally will be devoted to getting the full $5 billion out to our black farmers? How much time will you be putting into that? Because I believe if you got that as your top agenda, it will speed the process down the line. And because you're working it out, there are problems here. Go on. I, I don't have any doubt that my staff understands that this is the top of my list in terms of priorities. The whole equity issue, the whole equity effort is at the top of the list in terms of time that we will spend collectively as a team uh, focused on all these issues and specifically with the debt relief uh, portion of it. All right, thank you. I'll bring the gavel on myself here. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson for five minutes. Chairman, thank you so much. First of all, thank you. Thank you for the compelling testimony to each of the witnesses uh, today. Um, and. Uh, your, your verbal testimony and quite frankly, your written testimony that you would provided us. Um, the, um, I wanna reach out to uh, 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 Pastor and Mrs. Cotton, um, uh, say thank you so much for uh, your, uh, your ministry uh, and how you've uh, you know, really focused, uh, it, just all aspects of your ministry of, as I've been going through your testimony. At, uh, uh, what a blessing! Uh, what a blessing! Uh, uh, all the work that you do, really, uh, that and how you bring glory to uh, all glory and honor to God uh, in in your work is much appreciated. Um, uh, uh, you in your testimony, you mentioned the USDA's Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. Uh, can you elaborate more on your experience with the Faith Fellows training you, that you attended in Washington and how that experience contributed to your interactions with the USDA? Absolutely. Um, it was during that Faith Fellows training, and it was the, the initial, the inaugural training, um, that every department, nearly every department within the USDA was present. Uh, not only did they give individual presentations to the entire group, but at the end of the fifth day, by the end of the fifth day, they, we all gathered into an auditorium in sections. And we could go to those different departments uh, individually to ask questions, and they were able to answer those questions. As a result, we stayed in contact with them. 
as we begin to implement the, the instructions that they had given us and the different suggestions that they had given, we began to implement it. We became a 501c3 for a community outreach organization. We partnered with Land Grant University, both Langston University and OSU. We partnered with Convoy of Hope and other things. Uh, but this was as a result. Even Islamic Relief USA, we were able to partner with them as a result. When we had questions that could not be answered on the local level, we could reach out to those people in DC. And all of that was as a result of OPPE. Um, when, even when information conflicted on from here to there, they would get involved and help us to resolve. Uh, we begin to have community outreach meetings. Uh, we've had, I believe, six to date. We partnered with NRCS. We entered into the conservation program. And everyone who attends our program, as information is forwarded to us, we forward that information on to them. So we field telephone calls, answer questions, and then we attend every single meeting that we can on our local, district, state, and national level regarding all of these different entities. So we are busy beavers. Yeah, you are very busy. And uh, thank you for what you do. It sounds like it's very successful, uh, those partnerships, that collaboration. But based on your experience so far into this, uh, you know, we always look for opportunities, even when we're getting things right, you know, we always try to do better, right? Um, I think we're called yeah. to do that. Uh, is there any lessons you've learned so far uh, on improvements you would recommend on how we could continue to develop and maintain those <laughs> partnerships with black farmers and other socially disadvantaged farmers? Definitely. Uh, in most of the community outreach meetings, they are conducted by governmental employees, and they're basically saying the same thing. They come in, I've likened it to a USDA infomercial group because they say basically the same thing. If other uh, non-governmental employees um, with organizations who have proven records, who maybe possibly could even be trained by the government, to have a, they, they have a certain trust level that's got garnered with communities of color and people of color. Um, if those outreaches could be conducted by them in partnership with Land Grant University, in partnership with active um, black organizations, farming organizations, uh, such as the Oklahoma Black Historical uh, Society, and even our own uh, group to uh, put, put, uh, put out these um, uh, community outreach meetings and then follow through because I understand that in the USDA, many of the organizations have been compiled, joined in. So there are less bodies out in the field and that strain on the local employees uh, is felt with the local farmer. So we believe that if some sort of pilot program could be implemented to um, help us to be your feet on the ground, uh, in order to get this information out, we have proven these organizations that I've named, including USD, um, Langston and OSU, they prove they have a good proven record. Very effective. Well, thank you, Ms. Scott, and thank you, Chairman. Uh, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Thompson. I appreciate that. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this historic uh, hearing with the Agriculture Committee. And uh, and uh, uh, it's good to see you, Secretary Vilsack, my friend, uh, and for all your years of service to our country and your commitment today to root out uh, racism and discrimination that has been historic, as we noted by the testimony. And what terrific testimony our witnesses have provided and suggestions uh, and advice for legislation that as the chairman indicated, we will act on. In preparation for this hearing, I asked a constituent of mine, Mr. Will Scott, president of the African American Farmers of California to provide some testimony, which Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record. Uh, in his testimony, he details a history of discrimination from loan denials, as has been stated in the testimony earlier, to unequal access to markets, which is a problem. But I wanted to read a line that really stood out to me. Mr. Will Scott, a third generation farmer, like myself and our family, he said, members of the African American farmers of California 
are fearful to apply for any loans from the USDA and do not want to deal with government as they will fear they will lose everything they have. That's a sad commentary. You know, uh, we all know that farmers are risk takers. And when you have to deal with the discrimination that African American farmers and other minority farmers have had to deal with, it makes the risk taking all that greater. It's clear today from the history of discrimination at the USDA that there is still an impact. I remember uh, Secretary Vilsack talking to President Obama, and I shared this with uh, John Boyd uh, the other day, that uh, I told him, uh, President Obama, I said, you know, farmers are risk takers, uh, but they're also uh, price takers, not price makers. And President Obama is a very smart guy, but he's from a city. He says, price takers, not price makers. What do you mean? He said, well, you put all this investment every year into your crop, and then at the end of the year, you get whatever the price is. He says, I never thought about it that way. Price takers, not price makers. Mr. Secretary, it's critical that you work to provide and rebuild trust with black and other socially disadvantaged farmers so that American agriculture can better reflect the diversity in our country and our minority populations. In my own district, uh, the USDA has indicated that we've got 14 African American farmers, over 76 Native American farmers, 771 Asian farmers, mainly Pacific Asian farmers, over 1,000 uh, Hispanic farmers, and over 5,600, 5,600 uh, uh, Caucasian white farmers. Um, it's, it's important to note that out because discrimination is not only for African American farmers, but Southeast Asian farmers in my district. It's estimated that approximately over 1,000 Southeast Asian farmers in the Central Valley, many of them Hmong, that settled after the Vietnam War. Uh, the USDA, USDA aid has uh, not been there for them. I'd like to submit testimony from the Asian Pacific Institute Resource in Fresno, Long Zhang is the chair of that, detailing the shortcomings uh, and providing support to those farmers. And um, I'd ask unanimous consent to submit that testimony as well, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, one of the barriers to access of the USDA programs by black farmers and Southeast Asian farmers, Latino farmers in my district seems to be complicated and burdensome application to requirements in the backlog of the local farm service agency offices, FSA. Sanford Bishop, my colleague, and he's a cardinal and chairs the subcommittee on this, and I have talked about it. As part of your efforts to get more aid socially uh, to disadvantaged farmers, can you commit to ensuring that local FSA offices are properly staffed with the diversity reflected that the farmers they serve and have language capabilities? Yes. That's so important. You know, the, the previous administration, we complained that there wasn't sufficient support uh, in these FSA offices. The testimony we've heard already today has indicated that as such. You're going to have to focus that not only for the American Rescue Plan, but to really expedite the support for this. We have a backlog in CFAP 1 of over four months already in my own district. Uh, Representative, I think there are uh, several things to this. First, if you, there has to we have to cast a wider net for people to, to work in these local offices. Secondly, as has been mentioned earlier, we need more partnerships and more connections with community building organizations that can assist us. Uh, as has been indicated, there is a, a trust issue uh, that needs my to be time, addressed. My time is going to expire, but Mr. Chairman, I want to submit a third level of testimony. A staff member, Major uh, Henry Nunes, who's just retiring, is going to go to work for me, dedicated outreach to listen to stories needed for socially disadvantaged farmers in my district. I'd like to submit his report for the record. To the gentleman the gentleman has expired there. Thank you. Well, and I want to submit the testimony. Is that possible? Yes, that is possible. Thank you. Thank we'll you. take Mr. it. Thank I'd you. like to look at it and I'll share it with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Mr. Cox. And now I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Austin Scott, for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ms. Sherrard and Mr. Blanning and Mr. Rowe are from uh, right down the road from where I am. I actually live in Tifton, Georgia. Um, Ms. Sherrard, I don't have a question for you, but I'm very familiar with uh, what happened to you where somebody uh, change the context of what you said, and uh, you lost your job because of that in, in 2010, and uh, you want to 
I'm, I'm glad you won that suit against that news organization that ran that false article. Uh, I heard I heard what you said, and I, I saw what they reported, and I thought they very much changed changed the context. Uh, Mr. Blanding, I think you're very much right about the airs related issue. I think that's something that we can uh, work on together. If that is um, that it, that has happened, uh, and and I I hope that some of the money uh, that has come through the recent legislation uh, will help with that. And Mr. Rowe, you're obviously a, a young farmer. Um, in in Albany, Georgia, and uh, I'm right down the road in Tifton. If I can ever help you, you know, please please feel free to uh, reach out to us. And Mr. Boyd certainly enjoyed my conversation with you and your wife the other day. And um, as as I mentioned to you, you know, to to me, uh, some of the challenges of uh, the African American farmers are, they're they're not limited to African American farmers. It's pretty much all of our small farmers, beginning farmers, um, and uh, you, you know, I, I hope as we go forward, we're able to look at young, beginning, small, uh, you know, re regardless of, of, of race uh, with regard to how we handle things at the USDA, because there are a lot of people out there that that need uh, that need help. And we need more farmers, not fewer farmers in the United States. Uh, so I, I do have, and I, I, I told you this, Mr. Boyd, don't have a question for you, but I do have an issue with the language in Section 1005, Secretary Vilsack. And uh, can you tell me, Secretary Vilsack, were all of the socially disadvantaged farmers included in the relief provided in Section 1005? If, if you are uh, defining uh, socially disadvantaged farmers as it, as consistent with the 1990 Act, yes, which is based on race and ethnicity. There are other definitions. The current definition of a socially disadvantaged farmer, can you tell me who is excluded from Section 1005 versus the, the current definition of a socially disadvantaged farmer? I want to make sure I understand your question. Congressman, are you asking me, does the, does the provisions of the American Rescue Plan uh, de define socially a disadvantage, or are you referring to some other definition of socially disadvantaged? Sure, Secretary Vilsack, the current definition, you know what I'm getting at, you're wasting time. Uh, the current definition of a socially disadvantaged farmer, which farmers that are currently eligible for the socially disadvantaged farmer loans are not eligible for the relief under Section 1005? uh I, I, white women yes sir that's that's correct secretary vilsack um are you familiar with the case love versus vilsack yes sir and so um respectfully and that this isn't you you were named not personally but a secretary of the usda um so i don't I, this is not a personal accusation but 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 there was a settlement with that case as well correct there was and, and there's I'm, a difference there. There's a significant difference, Congressman, as you as I suspect, you know, between what we dealt with in love and what we're dealing with here. There, There is. Yes, sir. But but my concern is I think there are a lot of socially disadvantaged farmers. I think there are a lot of small farmers. I think there are a lot of people that need the help. And my concern is when we start to group certain people out because of the color of their skin, then it becomes harder to get anything done. Uh, if it's not equitable and it's not inclusive, then by definition, it's discriminatory. And when it's discrimination based on the color of someone's skin, then it's racist. Uh, that's just my personal belief. And I think most people would would accept that definition. Uh, so one, one last question for you, Secretary Vilsack. Would you commit to me that only American farmers would receive the relief under Section 1005 and not foreign nationals? I can't commit to that, Senator or Congressman, because that's not what the law that's been passed and signed by the president says, as you well so know. You, so and you're the, going and, to... Well, let me, let me finish. It's, it's important for people to understand that contained within the definitions covered by the American Rescue Plan are people that legitimately are entitled to borrow money from the FSA as a result of actions that were taken in 1984 when Jesse Helms was the chair of the Ag Committee and Ronald Reagan was president that opened up the opportunity at USDA to work with folks who were not citizens but who were legitimately here. 
So to the yes. extent that Congress passing the American Rescue Act includes all of those folks, that is what I'm mandated to do, and that's what we will do. We will follow the law, and I would expect sure. that you would want me to do that. So you're going to pay off the loans for foreign nationals, but you will not pay off the loans. Yeah, for the you. gentleman has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott, for your questions. I now recognize the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Mrs. Adams, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member, as well, uh, for hosting the hearing today. And to all of your witnesses, uh, our witnesses, thank you for your personal and compelling testimony. This is, as our chair has said, a landmark hearing. Uh, the need for federal support for Black farmers cannot be overstated. I want to just put on the record, I am a proud graduate twice of an 1890 North Carolina A&T but particularly because the most recent statistics from USDA make it clear that black producers were not served by the last administration's COVID relief programs. That's why last month I introduced the house version of the Justice for Black Farmers Act to address discrimination at USDA, to provide debt relief and to support a new generation of black farmers. It was good to speak with you, um, uh, Mr. Secretary, and uh, with you as well, Mr. Board, uh, just a day or two ago. Uh, I'm proudly uh, a supporter of the debt forgiveness for farmers of color in, a, in the American Rescue Plan Act. Some of my colleagues, though, on the other side have raised questions about the constitutionality of that provision, but we've studied the Constitution. We know that race-based actions by the government are subject to strict scrutiny by the courts. And in its 1995 Adirond decision, the Supreme Court held that government may use race-based remedies that are narrowly tailored to respond to the practice and effects of racial discrimination. Uh, after the Office of Legal Counsel at, at the Department of Justice uh, issued a legal memo which noted that Congress may be entitled to deference when it acts on the basis of race to remedy the, the effects of discrimination. And Mr. Chair, I ask for unanimous consent to submit for the record a copy of that 1995 memo. And, and that's what we have, thank you, and that's what we have in the American Rescue Plan. Congress narrowly tailing legislation to address well-documented racial discrimination against farmers of color. Mr. Secretary, my question for you, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, we've been talking about USDA's discrimination against black farmers and other farmers of color for decades now. In 1988, Congress tried to address it by re requiring USDA to set target participation rates for farmers of color in farm loan programs. But target participation rates and other important programs uh, like the 2501 program are limited in scope and haven't fully addressed the barriers faced by our black farmers. In the past five years, the number of direct farm loans to black producers decreased by nearly 50% from 945 to 460. So Mr. Secretary, what do you think might account for this steep drop in uh, direct farm loans to black producers? And what steps uh, is USDA willing to take to increase uh, that participation? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm not quite sure why uh, during the uh, Trump administration, the number of loans uh, decreased. But what I can tell you is, I think it's a combination of factors that we have to focus on. First, we have to have people uh, in the Farm Service Agency offices and in the county committees that reflect the uh, population that they serve. Uh, when I was secretary the last time, I did for the first time ever appoint minority members to county committees that did not have minority membership. I think that's important that we take a look at that county committee structure. I think it is important, as I said earlier, to connect with uh, community building organizations to make sure that outreach is taking place. One of the problems with COVID relief is that I don't, uh, we're pretty convinced that the outreach uh, to the socially disadvantaged uh, uh, population was not what it needed to be, which is why we announced yesterday as part of the, the uh, CFAP announcement, an, an effort to try to expand outreach and to reopen CFAP too, to give socially disadvantaged farmers greater opportunity to apply. Uh, so it's outreach. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I could, could uh, it's, it's outreach and it's also accountability. It, it, it reports to me directly keeping an eye on precisely how much progress we're making. And if we're not making progress, demanding a, a, some accountability and reasoning why. There's a lot more to this, uh, which let, I let me, to talk to you offline. Right, let me quickly ask you, uh, in the plan, uh, Congress provided for a, a new equity commission 
to address racial discrimination. Uh, we do need individuals on the commission who bring fresh eyes to the problem. And so I wanted you to share your plans to ensure that congressional and stakeholder input would be used in establishing the commission. Uh, I'm not we're sure if I'm out of time. We're, we're gonna Go follow FACA, uh, Congresswoman. We're gonna make sure that Congress and everyone else has uh, an understanding of participation. Uh, you can be assured that it's, we'll follow the rules and regulations of, uh, uh, of FACA. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think I'm out of time. I'm going to submit my other questions uh, to to the uh, to the other uh, guests. That'll be fine. I now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Jay Jarley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I thank you for holding this important hearing today. And it's always disturbing to hear uh, issues of discrimination. And uh, I, I feel for the people <clears throat> and the stories that I was told today. Um, I did want to mention there was a comment about Secretary Purdue. <clears throat> I'm sorry, in, in Tennessee, everything is in bloom. So forgive the, the voice and the allergies. <clears throat> but um, you know, Secretary Purdue uh, was a great ag secretary and great to work with. And I think when he said uh, that you need to go big, that was probably a comment. If you're a mom and pop store, it's hard to compete against Walmarts. If you're a hardware store, it's hard to keep, compete against Lowe's and Hope Depot. And I, and I would just say that knowing Secretary Purdue, uh, he did not mean that in, in any ill fashion. Also very appreciative to be able to work again with Secretary Vilsack. Uh, much appreciated for him reaching out to members of the Ag Committee not all secretaries take time to do that. So thank you, Secretary Vilsack, uh, for that. Um, I think th this hearing could have been better today <clears throat> if uh, alongside these witnesses were witnesses that were Hispanic and other people, anyone who's been discriminated against because farmers of every race, color, national origin, gender, and religion are struggling. Uh, U.S. farmers are saddled with near record debt there's high suicide rate among families uh, and farmers who are losing their livelihood. So it's a little troubling with some of the legislation <clears throat> that's been put forth uh, to, to have to see what's happening and then come back to my district. I, I could put the camera out my back door. There's cattle grazing, there's row crops. Uh, it's a rural area. There's small farmers and they're struggling too. <clears throat> so it's hard for me to, uh, tell them that there's help on the way, but only if you're a certain skin color. And it, it seems like that's discrimination in itself. And I would think that the panelists and witnesses today uh, didn't like the way they were treated and wouldn't want other people to be treated that way either. And it seems like what Austin Scott was saying, where foreign nationalists can get money under this COVID plan, but not white women uh, that that would uh, bother a lot of people. And I know they didn't get to finish that line of questioning, but discrimination in this country is already illegal as it should be. And it's the job of the courts to rule on discrimination and award damages, not Congress. Uh, we saw the 2.3 billion uh, go out to farmers in the Pigford settlement with dubious results. Uh, so now we have the American Rescue Plan that includes language for, for loan forgiveness for socially disadvantaged farmers, except the ones that Austin spoke of, for up to 120% of the outstanding debt. Um, Secretary Vilsack, did you feel the USDA was discriminatory while you were the head of the agency under the Obama administration? Uh, Congressman, I, I am certain that there were times and circumstances where people who were of color, black producers, Hispanic producers, uh, were not treated as fairly or as equitably as they should have been. Uh, when I was secretary, uh, we have over 4,000 offices. We have 100,000 folks working at USDA. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised if there were circumstances. What we did do, however, was we began a process which we're going to continue and deepen uh, in cultural transformation so that uh, the number of discriminatory actions is reduced and ultimately got to zero. We're going to keep uh, a record of EEO complaints and program complaints and make sure that if there was a, a spike in those complaints, we would find out why and take action to uh, to solve. Uh, and I will tell you, sir, with, with, <laughs> with due respect to this uh, this this discussion, I think people are losing sight of the fact 
that the Pigford case was designed to respond to specific acts of discrimination and compensate for this. The American Rescue Plan was designed to do two things. One, to deal with the cumulative impact of discrimination over time, where some people had the full range of suite of, of programs at USDA and were able to grow and, and, ex, and expand, and others did not. Just give you an example, CFAP 1 and CFAP 2. Of those who have been self-identified, uh, self-identified, now, Congress, this is really important, uh, self-identified, yeah, uh, black farmers received $20 million. Sir, um, I just want to finish with, I want us to all be aware as we try to unite as a nation uh, that actions like Senator Hirono and Senator Duckworth in the, in the Senate just recently saying they wouldn't vote for nominees unless they were diverse, that's discrimination in itself. We need to get rid of all discrimination. We need to come together as a people. I hope our panelists agree. That's what Mr. King would have wanted, and that's where we need to go. And so we need to be careful of that moving forward. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you uh, so much there for your testimony. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Let me make this uh, brief announcement before we move. To our next member to be recognized, I want to make uh, all of our members aware that the committee will take a short 15 minute recess following this question period with um, the general lady from Connecticut, Miss Hayes. Immediately after that, we will take a 15 minute uh, recess, and then we will come back. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Hayes, for her five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and thank you, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here. I just want to add that no one on this committee or in Congress woke up and just decided, let's send relief only to Black farmers or have this hearing. This is the result of years of pervasive discrimination and a problem that has existed that we in Congress recognize we have an obligation to address. So this isn't about, you know, what Dr. King would have wanted or, you know, we're leaving other groups out. It is about we are addressing an area of need that has gone unaddressed for so many years. Um, this is a pervasive problem, even in my district in Connecticut, which is not generally seen as an agrarian district. But according to the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, white landowners currently control about 95 to 98% of the farmland in the United States and nearly 100% in the Northeast. This stark disparity in land ownership is reflected in the demographics of Connecticut farmers. Non-white farmers represent just 2% of farmers in the state, according to our Census Bureau, which is an extremely low number when considering non-white communities represent nearly 35% of the state's overall population. So I'm happy that we are here today brainstorming solutions to address this and not taking the ostrich approach and sticking our hand, head in the sand and pretending that the problem does not exist. So my question is for you, Mr. Boyd. Can you speak to the disparities between black farmers and their white counterparts in assessing subsidies, capital, and land for their farms? Uh, yes, I can. And uh, thank you very much for, for the comments. And I also would like to take a step back and, and address the Sonny Perdue issue because I was the one that stated about that and the meeting I had with him. And I do believe that uh, he meant every word of it. He also said, if you wanted to know where uh, blacks are, uh, go to TSA and look at uh, New York City and Atlanta, Georgia, and based on all of my experience of meeting with agriculture secretaries going back to the Carter administration, that was my very first uh, uh, meeting, in, uh, my worst meeting in, in history with the agriculture secretary. Uh, and as it relates to farm subsidies, 90% uh, of all subsidies, uh, uh, while the top 10% receive on average 118,000, the bottom 80% annually in Mecklenburg County, Virginia receive about $700. Uh, annual. And if, when you looked at how we participated in the Trump uh, administration, the $29 billion uh, that was told out in those payments, uh, black farmers received 0.05%. Uh, those numbers uh, of people uh, 
uh, dramatic. And if I can't compete, if I can't uh, compete as far as staying in the, the farm subsidy program and receive farm subsidies the way that my white counterpart, I can't compete. I can't pay the, 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 the land rent and, and, and so on and so forth. So this hasn't just began, people. This has been going on for decades, for decades. So when you hear people uh, say about the relief that's out there now, Congresswoman, uh, that is, it's, it's a new loan program is what I've been watching on the news. This is a new loan program that excludes whites, white farmers. That's not true. It's debt relief. And as Secretary Vilsack already said, only for those farmers uh, that already have loans on the books. It's not a new loan. It doesn't exclude whites. We simply are trying to level the playing field. And, and the way to do that is to have full transparency. By having transparency, Thank you. yes, by having transparency, we can fix a whole lot of this. Thank you, and, and I'm happy that you mentioned transparency. The time goes by so quickly, yes, but the disparities that you just highlighted um, really stress the need for a robust, effective civil rights office within the United States Department of Agriculture. Due to this long history of civil rights cases being backed up in the USDA, um, with the 2008 Farm Bill, it required a report to Congress describing the number of civil rights complaints filed against the USDA, um, how the length of time it took to process those complaints and any follow up for the resolution. The average complaint was resolved in what amounted to about six years. So I, I know we really don't have time to address this, but Secretary Vilsack, I hope that you can really think about plans for improving the process for addressing civil rights cases within the USDA and making sure that we are providing equitable access to all farmers. Our job here is to help all farmers, but we also have a responsibility to address those areas of greatest concern and need. And right now, black farmers happens to be one of those areas. Um, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. The Mr. committee Chair. will now stand in recess under 2.15.
Carter. I'd now recognize the general lady from Missouri, Mrs. Hartsmith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. Thank you to all our witnesses. And I also want to uh, thank uh, Secretary Bill Sack for reaching out to us, members of Ag Committee, to hear our ideas of concerns in agriculture and where we need to go. I really appreciate that. And Mr. Secretary, I want to follow up on some of your comments in your opening statement about some of the challenges of, of rolling out this provision. Uh, and specifically, uh, I've been hearing from some banks, and you did reference that you don't know how you're going to deal with a prepayment penalty. Uh, but I'm hearing that banks that originate FSA guaranteed farm loans have raised concerns about the unintended consequences that the prepayment of these loans will have on lenders, including their ability to make and service these loans in the future. So can you go into more detail about uh, what USDA is going to do to work with these banks uh, to mitigate the costs and to provide certainty for our farmers? Well, uh, thank you very much for the, the question. I think the first thing is we need to have a very detailed understanding of precisely what concerns they have and why they have them. Uh, I've asked the team uh, to reach out to and to identify those loans that uh, potentially have prepayment uh, issues, uh, re uh, reach out to the banks, ask for the documentation of the uh, prepayment uh, penalties, and, and begin a conversation and discussion uh, in terms of how that's to be handled. So uh, it's going to take, obviously, a little time to do this, but we're going to be focused on making sure we put adequate staff behind this effort to get it done, and done it, as I said, as quickly as possible, as thoughtfully as possible, and as efficiently as possible. Right. Uh, how many of these loans are there that you'll be forgiving? Well, uh, I don't think we necessarily know precisely how many. We, we I'm going to give you a range. Uh, our best knowledge and best information today is somewhere between 13 and 15,000 loans uh, that are potentially impacted uh, by this. It could be more. Um, it could it could be less, but I think it's somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to follow up with Philip Heaney. Thank you so much for your your passionate testimony, but I was concerned to hear about how you said you can't access uh, USDA irrigation loans and you can't participate in land leveling programs like other farmers. I just wonder, could you share more what happened or, or how come you couldn't? What happened there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Uh, a lot of black farmers throughout the Delta where the common practice is in place for land leveling and irrigation. These programs that are issued by USDA and NRCS, and oftentimes they're told they weren't available to them. So they're competing against neighbors side by side, and they often find themselves on an island where they are a non-irrigated farm, and they have irrigated farmers on all four sides of them. So the practices of yeah. putting irrigation on their farms are something that needs to be implemented sure. through the USDA and there should be cost share allowance for that. Sure. Yeah, uh, could you tell me more though that you were told or, or you know some uh, farmers that were told that these aren't available to you? Yes, oftentimes farmers go in to apply for these programs and they're told that there are no funds available to assist them with that. The cost share that's available for uh, the EQIP program for land leveling and irrigation, those funds often dry up. And at the cost of implementing these improvements on their farms, they aren't able to forbear them, unlike their neighbors who were able to get these programs implemented during the crux of discrimination at USDA back in the 80s. So these farmers are still without and their neighbors are with irrigation right beside. Okay, so the the problem is that the EQIP funds have have run out when when you, the, that you've gone in and asked and they didn't have the funds available or the matching requirement was a was the problem is that what i'm hearing well oftentimes farmers are told their funds not available and they may that may not be the case i don't think there's enough oversight in that issuance of those subsidy programs for land leveling and irrigation for improvements on the farm Oftentimes that pot runs out of money very soon and farmers have to wait for it to be refilled. I, I think gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That was uh, you know, I think that's really helpful. We get to the bottom of what's 
you know, being alleged happened here. And, and I wanted to uh, ask Mr. Boyd, well, we only have 12 seconds. Okay. But uh, I appreciate your, um, your all's testimony. Thank you. I go back. Thank you very much. I now recognize the general lady from Maine, Miss Pingree, for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, I have actually been in one of my other committees, so I have um, missed all of your wonderful questions and answers, um, but I really do appreciate that you're all here, and um, I've certainly appreciated reading your testimony. So, uh, Mr. Rowe, I'm particularly interested in um, you being an organic farmer, and I know that you're very focused on soil health and carbon sequestration, which is certainly a topic of this committee and, and one moving forward. As the USDA considers possible initiatives to encourage farmers to adopt climate friendly practices, what recommendations would you make to Secretary Vilsack or the members of this committee to make sure that you and other black farmers are able to benefit? Okay, uh, you can repeat that question one more time. Can you repeat the question one more time? Oh, absolutely. Um, so um, as you are an organic farmer, um, I know you're very focused and you have um, educational background in soil health. Um, and because this committee is focused on soil health and carbon sequestration, um, and some interesting new initiatives um, to encourage farmers to adopt climate friendly practices. I'm wondering what recommendations you would make to the secretary and to this committee to make sure that you and other black farmers are able to benefit from future initiatives. Okay, um, the, the standards, well, the, in order for you to obtain your certification to be, to be organic certified, you have to follow uh, um, strict guidelines on how what you put into your soil, what you, what equipment you use, and stuff like that. I feel like if you apply that to farming, period, it'll help with a lot of the stuff when it comes to like climate change. Just because, um, you know, the carbon that comes out the soil, um, you know, way organic practices is a way to make sure we're staying healthy and also them keeping the environment healthy. As you know, conventional farming takes a lot of chemicals and a lot of stuff to make stuff grow. But that affects us as humans. It affects the air and the pollution and stuff like that. So I, you know, I I would recommend you know more you know observing the organic standards and qualification you need to be organic certified. And you know that's something I can, if I had uh, you know something just to say, that'll be my opinion on it. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I've spent some time as a certified organic farmer, so I certainly. Um, sympathize with the challenges and the expenses of facing that, so more support is Im important. Um, Secretary Vilsack, uh, I'm sorry I've not been able to hear most of the hearing, but I did hear your opening remarks, and I, I do appreciate you uh, returning, um, particularly at such a challenging time. Welcome back as uh, Secretary um, again for Agriculture. So um, I know a lot of um, your agenda will be around some very interesting climate initiatives, soil health, a whole variety of things that um, you've already talked about. How do you make sure that small to medium sized farmers and particularly uh, black farmers um, are able to participate And this doesn't just become another program that, you know, only applies to the large farmers or those that have the means to apply for a grant or, you know, any of the complications that might get in the way. Uh, quickly, I would respond three ways. First, I, uh, we, I have uh, Dr. Dwayne Goldman uh, in my office now as the senior advisor on equity. Uh, part of his responsibility is to put uh, an equity lens uh, on everything we do and to encourage those who are developing these programs to make sure that there is an equity lens when the program is being developed. Uh, secondly, is to make sure that we are keeping track of the resources that are being allocated in various programs and how much of it is, in fact, going to socially disadvantaged producers. If we see, as we saw with COVID, uh, some, some imbalance, uh, we can obviously make uh, corrections. We can ask questions about that. Um, I think it's also important for us to have partners um, who can help us with outreach. Uh, sometimes we it, it's not that people don't want to help. It's that people don't know that they need the help or, or don't know where to go to get the help. Um, as has been uh, indicated earlier, there's a trust issue that we, I think we have to build trust. And I think the way to do that is by connecting ourselves with community building organizations that are already trusted uh, to get the word out. Um, you know, I think it's also uh, making sure that as uh, as we put our budgets together, 
Uh, we look at places and, and, and programs that we know will be most helpful. And one of the purposes of this hearing, I'm taking notes right now of the suggestions that people are making. Uh, obviously, that's going to impact and affect as we make uh, future budget decisions. So it's a combination of all of those things uh, and, and basically saying to the folks, and I'll, I'll end with this, basically saying to your team, this is a priority and it needs to be reflected in every decision you make. You need to be able to justify and explain how equity has been applied. Uh, the president's been very clear about this. It is his expectation that everything we do at USDA is done through an equity lens. And I think that's a, a fair point and one that we are looking forward to uh, to doing. Well, I certainly appreciate um, your answer there and, and the importance of all of the points that you've mentioned, um, particularly around outreach, because we often find that uh, people have no idea that there are programs out there that would benefit benefit them. But also, I think the USDA having that lens, you know, we often write into a program that there should be a set aside for this or a set aside for that. But um, clearly, it's it's going to be far more effective if the USDA sees that as their responsibility to make sure that the distribution is fair and particularly that underserved farmers um, have those opportunities. So um, I only have seven seconds, so I will we, yield we, back. We and Congresswoman, we'll also get some suggestions from the Equity Commission uh, in terms of overall structure and strategy that will be helpful as well. Great. Well, thank thanks you. so much. I now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson. And thank you to the witnesses and my good friend, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today to discuss the impact of racism in the United States and the work we must continue to do to ensure there's equity across programs at the USDA. Uh, as a former chair of the Subcommittee on Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research, I spent a, a lot of my time in Congress focused on the importance of our ag research and extension programs, uh, which should help serve farmers across the board and particularly minority and socially disadvantaged farmers. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss how we can work to bolster extension programs those that help serve minority and socially disadvantaged farmers in a way that decreases barriers to access and increases participation in USDA programs. Uh, Mr. Rowe, thank you for being here today and for sharing your experience as a black organic farmer. I was particularly interested in your experience in navigating the new hemp program, along with other USDA organic programs, which have proved challenging for so many. Can you please share more regarding the unique challenges you face trying to navigate the hemp program, specifically in light of the 2018 Farm Bill, and what you need from us and the department to ensure you have certainty and access to profitable markets? Okay, um, it was a challenge, you know, um, going to hemp because, um, as you know, Georgia just got, you know, we, we're just able to grow organic hemp, well, hemp in general, and we're, a lot of farmers are uneducated on it. Um, federal um, government assistance doesn't don't have a lot of research on it. Also, so working with universities and doing research on this new crop that just you know just the Georgia is just not growing will also be helpful. Um, some of the things that I was um, as growing hemp my first year, um, I knew as far as like diseases or what variety would grow. Things like that, a, a farmer didn't know. So, like, having those land grant and research um, available for farmers to be able to reach out. Um, I know we used to, um, Fort Valley State University does a lot of um, field research. Um, like, when people, they'll have a field day where they'll do a particular crop and, and, you know, explain how to grow it, what it takes, and all of that. If we can get something like that implemented with the hemp program, it'll be very helpful because it's, it's less knowledge on this new crop that's just. Hey, well, well, thank you, Mr. Rowe. I, I'd be interested in keeping a working relationship with you uh, as we move forward to identify any other problems that you're experiencing in the organic sector. So, Secretary Vilsack, hey, uh, great to see you again. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you and I have chatted about the work across agencies and with the FDA that's needed to ensure that we're providing regulatory certainty for hemp and organic farmers, including black, minority, and socially disadvantaged farmers? Uh, well, Congressman, I think first order, uh, we, we have to have our own house in order in terms of being able to work effectively with other agencies 
uh, which is why it was important for us to get the hemp roll out. Uh, it had been uh, stuck for a while. Uh, we're, we, we're doing that. Uh, we're now in a position, I think, to reach across uh, uh, to HHS and FDA to make sure that there is a coordination. And frankly, you mentioned biotechnology. Uh, there's obviously a need for us to coordinate effectively with both uh, FDA and uh, EPA, and I, I expect to do that. Uh, we have to have a, a process. I would say in this day and age, with change rapidly occurring so quickly, our regulatory processes have to keep pace with the pace of change. And frankly, sometimes we basically uh, slow innovation down because a regulatory process is not communicating effectively between agencies. Uh, that's something we need to work on. Well, thank you, sir, for that. And, and welcome back. As I told you before, I look forward to working with you again. And congratulations on, uh, on getting back into the USDA one more time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I now recognize the general lady from New Hampshire, Mrs. Tusk, for five minutes. I think you may be I'm just trying to get my uh, my mute off here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Vilsack. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for all the work that you're doing, and I'm grateful for the farmers and producers on the panel for coming forward to share any all of your challenges and insights. Our country is in the midst of a reckoning on racial justice and addressing systemic racism. And I think that's the difference. This is not a question of simply uh, prejudice or discrimination. We need to go back to the beginning and the racism uh, since slavery that has led to black farmers not even being able to show a title to their land. Um, this past year has not only brought a global pandemic, but countless painful reminders that we still have so much work ahead of us on equality and justice here in America. And has been discussed today, we have a glaring problem when it comes to American agriculture. Instead of improving, the number of black farmers in our country and the amount of land they own has shrunken dramatically and continues to decline. And we need to ask why and make it changes that will turn that trend around. It's incumbent on Congress and the USDA to reverse this trend and ensure that our agriculture sector is diverse and that every single farmer and producer is treated with fairness and equality. So let's be clear, if black farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers are systematically driven out of agriculture, there would be horrible consequences for consumers and growers across the country. We have to write things, these wrongs, and move forward together. Ms. Sharon, as you noted in your testimony, black farmers are still impacted by discrimination because government payments are tied to production. Systemic discrimination has resulted in black-owned farms being smaller than white farms, so black farmers typically receive smaller government payments. From your experience, how can Congress help level the playing field and make sure that black farmers with smaller operations aren't penalized when it comes to applying to the USDA. You may need to. And that was for Miss Sharon. Did it go back oh, on? Gerard, no, I'm sorry. That was for Miss Sharon. Is it Gerard? You mean? Sherard, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. All right. Uh, you may need to move. Let me. Okay, you got it, Ms. Sherard. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can... Uh, let me say that, you know, are we still mute? No, you're, no, you're good. We can hear you. Now, now you're muted. Go back to where you were. Okay, okay. We're good. Okay. Let me say that I've worked on this issue for many, many years, almost 56 years. And I've gone, I've actually gone from a period when I had to go in the office with farmers for because they were afraid to go. They couldn't speak up for themselves. And I could speak for them and I could help represent them. What that has done is um in addition to farmers trying and being denied, they don't feel it's a place for them to go. We have to go back and try to, to try to help farmers understand that this agency is there for them. 
because so many of them think that is not the case. So many of them think like one of my grandfathers, when when he had the opportunity to try to apply for money, he said, I'll never borrow money from Farmers Home Administration because it's just a way to take a black farmer's land. That has proven to be true. Uh, you were breaking up, so I didn't hear all of your question. But let me say, we have to go back and make people feel that this is a place they can come to for help. Great. Well, thank you so much. Dr. Boyd, could you speak to the unique challenges that you've seen Black farmers with smaller farms face when it comes to ensuring that their land can be passed to the next generation? Yes, this has been a difficult task. And uh, one of the challenges is, is uh, access to credit. Uh, black farmers simply don't have access to credit. Uh, USDA has been uh, played into that and also the top 10 banks. And uh, we haven't got to talk about uh, corporate America and the, the discrimination that black farmers face there and, and companies like Monsanto, uh, John Deere, uh, PepsiCo, all have failed to uh, deliver contracts and services to, to black farmers. So these are things that, that are coupled all together that uh, has affected us. Uh, USDA uh, certificates of liens uh, that was on my property. Uh, when I had debt relief uh, at the United States Department of Bank, I was one of the first black farmers to be offered debt relief in the settlement agreement. Those the liens were made um, on my farm for over 20 years until we were able to, to try to purchase another farm. We had to hire a law that, firm to get those liens off of my farm. Yes, the general, the general lady has it. Thank you. I, I yield back, Mr. For Chairman. Your comments. I appreciate them, Ms. Boyd and uh, Ms. Custer. Now recognize the general, uh, gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon, for his. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the panelists. today and each of you we appreciate reaching out across the aisle and also appreciate the opportunity to meet John Boyd uh, and there is no doubt that our Amer African American farmers following reconstruction were faced with discrimination and prejudice extending for over a century Our history is important to grow. Mr. Chair, your testimony mentions that settlement did not bring about systematic change. Deep-rooted changes to a system or an agency do take time. Have there been any improvements to your knowledge that can lead to the systematic change that you are referencing? Thank you. Well, basically, what what the lawsuit did was really. Uh, bring about discrimination issues to the Department of Agriculture. But many of the issues that we were, that was a part of the lawsuit never went to black farmers, such as injunctive relief, uh, such as uh, debt write down, uh, land out of federal inventory. None of the farmers received those things. And that's why it's vitally important that we have this measure. Uh, so many people think that it's, it's a new issue. It's not a new issue. We asked for, we asked for debt relief and the actual uh, 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 lawsuit. And also, we need transparency. If we want to fix any of this, we need transparency to see who's getting what and what programs, uh, such as farm subsidies. If we had those real numbers, uh, this hearing would be, would be a lot clearer today. We'll be able to say, this race received this amount of subsidies, uh, black farmers received this amount. So we need full transparency. And for those uh, 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 committee members that are here today, we should really take a, a pretty good look at that. And also, those persons who were found guilty of discrimination were never fired or penalized. As you heard uh, Ms. Sherrod testify, she was the only someone that, who got fired. How in the world can you have two settlements and all of those people that was investigated that were found guilty of discrimination and nobody was fired? And it's a shame for the taxpayers who had to, who had to pay for that. So we need to look at those people who are uh, past and present who are still working at USDA, 30-year uh, uh, bureaucrats who still have their jobs Black farmers lost their land and farms, but these people still have their jobs. So I would like to work with the committee to, to move forward on a transparency measure. Well, thank you, Mr. Boyd. I was also asking Ms. Sherrod uh, if she sees a systematic change 
uh, that does take a long time uh, to do. It's, she's seeing pro progress and a systematic change uh, in the agencies she's, she's working in. Let me say that there, you know, there has been some change, but not nearly enough to make up for what's been done. And what, you know, if you, if you keep messing with someone and they get, keep getting hurt, they eventually stop going in that direction. So we have so many farmers who need to go to the agency and they can't and don't feel they should go to the agency because they've never been able to get help there. And if it were not for, for groups like us, even working with Mr. Cedric Rowe and others to try to help navigate that for them, you know, there's just no way they'll ever get help. The, the, the culture there is changing some, because I've been at this 50 some years, but I haven't seen enough change. Oh, thank you, Ms. Sharon. And I think you, you have a good point if you're grand tells you something, your father tells you something, not to do so. Uh, with my remaining minute, I got another follow-up for uh, Mr. Boyd. Uh, you highlighted the need to improve technical assistance and outreach to black farmers. Are you starting to see that now? Are we making progress there? Thank you. I believe, that, and thank you, Congressman, for the question. I believe that the mechanism that's on the table right now in the Farmers of Color Act, the $1 billion, uh, uh, the Secretary and his team should uh, reach out and work with organizations like the National Black Farmers Association and all of the other panelists that are here today. We have a unique opportunity to fix outreach and technical assistance in this measure, something that's been lacking, uh, as you heard my colleagues testify to, in the 2501 program. This is an opportunity right now to fix that, where organizations like ours, uh, we need resources. Uh, since this bill has been announced, uh, phones are ringing off the hook for farmers that are looking for direction. Uh, they want to know how this debt relief is going to be paid out, how it's going to apply to them. And uh, we, we haven't heard enough yet from the administration. And, and I would like to ask uh, Secretary Vilsack, he mentioned the, the uh, commission. Who's yeah. going to be on the, on the commission? Yeah, Who's going to the time has uh, expired. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Bustos, for five minutes. Uh, Thank you so much, Chairman Scott. And, and also, let me just say thank you for holding this very, very important hearing today. I want to thank all of our witnesses. You've all done a wonderful job. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. I want to start out with a question for you, sir. Um, and, and I'm actually going to use some facts that Dr. Boyd shared in his opening remarks. So thank you, Dr. Boyd, for laying the, the, the picture out for what black farmers in America have gone through. The numbers have fallen dramatically. We, uh, as Dr. Boyd pointed out, from 900,000 in 1920 to less than 50,000 today. Uh, Dr. Boyd also pointed out that the amount of land that's farmed by black farmers has fallen from 41 million acres to less than 5 million acres today. Uh, so, so again, Dr. Boyd, thank you for, for laying that out. It helps us get, get an understanding that we, we got something going wrong here. Um, so, so Secretary Vilsack, um, if I may, what steps can Congress take uh, to help you at the Department of Agriculture to ensure that black farmers get involved in and remain in agriculture? Well, I think you've taken a very important and first step with the American Rescue Plan, uh, the debt relief process, as we've talked about, is, is an important step. The Equity Commission, which we will set up pursuant to a congressional directive uh, with the FACA, we have to go through that process to get committee members appointed, is going to be very helpful to identify systemic barriers that exist from an external view. We've got a working group uh, inside USDA focused on internally examining this. I think uh, Dr. Boyd's right about the $1 billion. There's tremendous opportunity there, not only to improve outreach, but also to look at ways in which we can do better marketing assistance for farmers in that local and regional food system that they need to be part of, and also creating opportunities potentially for um, uh, more market opportunities uh, and, and more land access. Uh, I think Congress could help us by talking to other federal agencies, in addition to the USDA, that have land ownership. I'm thinking of the Department of Defense, for example. They have a lot of land that surrounds a lot of the military installations. A lot of that land is in rural communities. A lot of that land is farmable. 
where and who do they have farming that land? Can that be something that could potentially be made available uh, to minority uh, and socially disadvantaged and beginning farmers? Uh, that, that's one thing I think Congress could ask. And, and certainly uh, to the extent that you would provide the resources uh, for us at USDA, our budgets uh, over the course of the last several years have been pretty, uh, have been cut, which makes it harder for us to have the people and the personnel necessary to do the job. Hopefully uh, we will see uh, some additional support and help uh, on the operation side of the budget. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. And I appreciate that innovative approach that uh, we can take a look at. Um, so we, we know that obviously, again, this has been spelled out very clearly, we need to do more to level the playing field between black farmers and white farmers, including greater transparency in subsidy and loan programs. That's been discussed today. We need to improve access to land, as, as you just talked about, Mr. Secretary, and credit, improve our outreach to black farmers. You just laid that out very nicely. Um, so um, I, I'm lucky enough to be chair of the General Farm Commodities and Risk Management Subcommittee uh, this, this congressional session. And I know that uh, these are all issues that are important to me as, as we get to work on our agenda, this Congress and gear up for the next farm bill. Um, so this question is actually to whoever would like to answer it among, uh, among the panelists. And, and Dr. Boyd, I'm gonna ask you to start, but um, what have your experiences been with the commodity programs at USDA? Again, this, this falls under the committee that I'll be chairing. Um, and the second part of that is what steps can Congress take to ensure that black farmers feel welcome at the USDA? Well, one thing I would do, and, I, and I've said this to every member of Congress, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me the other day, is that- Thank uh, you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, black farmers need to hear from you that USDA is open for business for black farmers, open for business for farmers of color, Native American women, all of these uh, are persons of color. Make that announcement and make it with conviction because uh, we're gonna have to uh, get farm, black farmers and reintegrated back into USDA because as you heard uh, Ms. Sherrod and, and my other uh, colleagues say today, Black farmers don't trust the United States Department of Agriculture, which has uh, re really hurt us in participation. And, and, and it's because of all the discrimination that I and others have, have faced. And we also need to do more to get new beginning farmers in, into uh, farm programs at USDA and remove the three-year uh, uh, requirement uh, so that Black farmers and other uh, newer beginning farmers can actually take part into uh, the uh, USDA programs there. So removing that three-year barrier has, has been a big problem, and I, and I would like to work with you guys to, to remove that. Thanks, Secretary. Yes. I, I, I wish I had time to listen to everybody, but my time has expired. And uh, Secretary Vilsack, I do want to follow up on, yes. on your idea with the Department of Defense. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and I yield back. Absolutely. I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank uh, Ranking Member Thompson for putting on this uh, informative program. I'm gonna start with the, uh, the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement and uh, mention that, uh, you know, they hosted last year, I think, 50 statewide community uh, prosperity summits to focus on solutions to challenges facing rural and underserved communities and connect them to the education tools and resources available to them through the USDA programs and initiatives. And in 2020, as an example, uh, they connected hundreds of uh, faith-based as well as youth, as well as military and community organization to distributors to form partnerships through the Farmers to the Families Food Box program uh, during the COVID-19. So I guess my first question uh, is gonna go to Mr. and Mrs. Cotton. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned USDA's Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. Uh, can you elaborate uh, more on your experience with the Faith uh, Fellows Training you attended in Washington, D.C., and how that experience contributed to your interactions with the USDA? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Cotton. Thank you, Thank sir, you, sir, for this opportunity and the question. Um, um, by being at the Faith Fellows initial, inaugural training, we met uh, the Convoy of Hope. We also met City Serve. We also met Islamic Relief USA. We met those various organizations. When we came back to Oklahoma, 
we reached out to Convoy of Hope and then subsequently had meetings with them. After those meetings, then we rented us a big <laughs> semi truck and we drove to Missouri to pick up our first food. Um, interim, in the interim, um, as we began to distribute food, we learned that there was a hub here in Oklahoma called North Star Bridge for Convoy of Hope. And from North Star Bridge, we began to pick up food. First in a car, then a truck, then a horse trailer, 14 foot, then a 20 foot horse trailer. After the Farmers to Family Food Box program started, North Star Bridge saw that we were serious about helping our community. So they began to distribute trucks to us. We were receiving up to four semi trucks a week in our small rural area. Uh, the people come because we've been consistent. They come because they trust. Um, there's not been any training in what we do. We've been in the service of the Lord for most of our lives. Uh, it's just reaching people, helping people, the humble service. And so, because the government realized that faith-based entity are the bottom kind of rung of the ladder for individuals who have their trust in someone, they began to use the faith fellows so that as a pinpoint for these activities. The thing of it is, is that it was a truck to trunk program. And often the vendors across the US, as they received these fundings to distribute the food, were sending it out, but that last mile delivery, uh, the people were not really realizing any financial help from it. Today, as a matter of fact, we canceled two semi trucks so that we could be here today, all right? Tomorrow we'll have a once a month senior program that will distribute food there. But this has created great opportunities for us to continue to figure out how in the world we can get from busyness, you know, to actual business in reaching our communities. Yes, sir. My husband just said community togetherness. In our community, the testimonies are a mile long. Um, that's basically what we have to offer on that. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Bilzock, would you care to comment about uh, the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement? I think you made reference to that earlier. Uh, and give you an opportunity to, we got about 37 seconds. So, Well, uh, it is an important integral part of our effort to improve outreach, but I think we have to do more uh, in that area. And we have to basically cast a much wider net in terms of the partnerships that we're developing. And I think the opportunity for us at USDA is, starts with the sort of black colleges and minority serving institutions because they have an incredible network. And I think we need to tap into that network more effectively and more efficiently than we have in the past. That's where I would start. So I've got about four seconds left and I just have to put a plug in for the uh, land grant universities and the cooperative extension service uh, because they've played a vital role over the years in making sure we got the research information uh, out to these uh, rural communities. And I know, Mr. Chairman, you're ready to hammer, put the hammer on because I've reached my time. So thank you. Sir, I, I appreciate the gentleman realizing his time has expired. I now recognize the general lady from the United States Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank to you to all of our witnesses for being here today and particularly Thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for um, your commitment to the issues that we are addressing in this hearing, which has long been overdue at the full committee level. Uh, and I want to also just, you know, applaud my colleagues for their patience and their steadfastness in getting to the meat of the issues here uh, in this hearing. Um, Secretary Vilsack, one of the questions that I have um, is related to the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program um, and CFAP2 payments, which have been successfully compensated all producers, at least partially, who have experienced unexpected economic loss uh, costs due to the COVID-19 during the second through fourth quarters of 2020. Uh, are we aware or how, what are the mechanisms and data that we have for to know that CFAP2 funds have been distributed in a fair manner to every producer and for every commodity sector that experienced COVID-19 related costs 
I ask that question in particular, as you have shown um, through your uh, quick, you know, uh, uh, appointment to agriculture, the disparity in distribution to black farmers uh, in the other funding. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, payments that have been made to those who have self-identified as white, black, and other uh, socially disadvantaged categories, in CFAP 1 and CFAP 2, black farmers would have received approximately 20 to $21 million. A white farmers, a white men and women farmers would have received $5.6 billion. So that's why I think that one of the things you did in the American Rescue Plan was to essentially understand and appreciate the disparity uh, in terms of how the COVID relief was distributed in terms of, uh, of how much uh, went to white farmers and how much went to socially disadvantaged farmers. And part of what you've done, I think, is you've basically created a better sense of balance, if you will, in the COVID relief efforts. We tried to complement that recently with the announcement that we're going to do additional outreach on CFAP2 to make sure that those socially disadvantaged producers that have not yet applied for uh, the ability to participate in the program are given a 60-day opportunity to do so. And the hope is with additional outreach that we'll see more uh, applications from socially disadvantaged producers. Thank you. As a follow-up to that question, sir, um, Mr. Secretary, with this debt relief that you have that has been provided for black farmers, is there an assumption or shouldn't there be an assumption that other tacit forms of discrimination at the pro at the department need to be corrected? And what is being done to identify what those other areas might have been and how they can be rectified and monitored? Well, there are three parts to the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we met, we talked about debt relief. And we've also talked about the billion dollars uh, that could potentially increase outreach, uh, land access, and financial marketing. The, the, the third element is the Equity Commission. Uh, and this commission is going to be an external commission that's going to take a detailed look at every single aspect of USDA's activities to determine and to identify those systemic barriers that may exist in the way in which programs are operated. At the same time that that is going on, we're also going to have, pursuant to President Biden's uh, executive order, an internal review. Uh, we already have a working group that has been established. They've already begun the process of assessing our, our benefits, our services, our contracts, and our procurements. And I would put particular emphasis in response to your question on the issue of contracts and procurements. As we're looking at ways of increasing market opportunities, especially for small and mid-sized operators, for socially disadvantaged farmers, for beginning farmers, the opportunity to use federal purchasing power, the procurement power of the federal government, may be a strategy uh, that will provide some quick wins, if you will, in terms of market access. And that's something I hope our team will be uh, taking a very close look at. Thank you. And as a final um, thought, uh, in having conversations with some of the witnesses prior to the uh, hearing today, I'm particularly uh, moved by and concerned with regard to uh, discussions with Mr. Boyd where he talked about not necessarily just at the Department of Agriculture, but in the whole life cycle of black farming, issues of access to farm credit, to bank um, loans, uh, even to have those uh, companies who they rely on for equipment to have different policies and um, leverages for black farmers than they do for others. Have you been thinking of or would you be willing to sit with us as legislators to come up with ways to both incentivize those organizations and those outside and private entities to support black farming to grow it, as well as to find ways to enforce um, federal law against discrimination and to support them? Has expired. I now recognize the- um, May he answer the question, um, Mr. Chairman? Dakota. Mr. Chairman, I, I'll just respond yes to your question. <laughs> Thank Carl. you. Uh, and, and yeah, and also, uh, Mr. Secretary, you can respond more in, the, in writing for the record. And, uh, I apologize for everyone, but we're trying to get everyone in. And so I hope you will uh, help me here. I want to hear from everybody too. And perhaps um, uh, Mr. Boyd can relate to your uh, question 
when he is recognized again. Thank you for your consideration, members. I now recognize the uh, gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I'll direct my comments and questions to Secretary Vilsack. I, I would first note, sir, that uh, you've, you've invested a remarkable amount of time already in, in speaking with me and other members of the committee since you uh, were sworn in. So thanks for that. I think it shows an authenticity and an earnestness on your part uh, to do this work together. Uh, and I think this committee hearing has been fantastic as we talk about how to make sure that we are serving all of agriculture and, and all producers. It's, uh, it, it's been a wonderful hearing. Uh, and in that vein, I, I want to call out and commend USDA, sir, for uh, the appointment of Zach Ducheneau as administrator of the Farm Service Agency. Uh, Mr. Ducheneau has been an incredible advocate for South Dakota agriculture, for tribal agriculture, for socially disadvantaged farmers. Uh, he's an enrolled member at, at uh, uh, Cheyenne River, and he's uh, he's going to be really good at the job. And so thank you to USDA for uh, walking uh, your, your interest in diversity, uh, sir, on that front. Uh, the, the, the one question I've got for you, uh, Mr. Secretary, follows up on uh, my March 3rd letter and gives you a little real-time update uh, related to my concerns with the U.S. Forest Service uh, recommendation to reduce uh, the timber sale program. And, and there is a real impact here on socially disadvantaged people uh, because uh, a huge portion of the forestry workers who are impacted uh, are, are Latino, uh, Latina. And uh, the update is just this week uh, in Hill City. That's a town of about a thousand in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Uh, a large sawmill has announced that it's closing. 40% of those 120 employees uh, are Hispanic. Uh, that comes the same week that we have the Forest Service announce uh, via a general technical report that they think that the timber harvest coming out of uh, the Black Hills should be reduced by 50 or 60%. And we know that when you lose those jobs uh, uh, from socially disadvantaged people uh, in forestry, in timber, they are highly unlikely to come back. That capacity doesn't come back very easily. We've seen that across the country. And, and so I just want to make sure, uh, sir, that that's on your front burner and uh, just asking for a commitment uh, to work with you and the Forest Service in continuing to analyze the science behind these studies. We want to make sure that uh, when we've got socially disadvantaged employees, they've got an opportunity to keep those good paying jobs and, and help out their communities. A any thoughts, sir? Uh, Congressman, I certainly appreciate the, the importance of outreach and connection with stakeholders who have a strong interest, as you've expressed, in, in the Black Hills. Uh, I would hope that our Forest Service and I believe our Forest Service will continue to be engaged in uh, continued collaboration. Uh, as you've indicated, uh, the scientists from the Northern Research Station's Forest Inventory and Analysis Program uh, recently concluded their study. I would point out that this, th th this is a scientific document. It is not a policy or decision document, so I think it is important to note that to your point of whether or not there are other considerations or other science or other information that needs to be considered. Obviously, I think we need to take everything into consideration before any specific decisions are made. Um, it's, a, it's a large body of science, obviously, that's now available uh, to uh, managers in the Black Hills. They can take a look at it, they can respond to it, they can react to it, and then it will give us the opportunity to, uh, to sort of take into consideration as we finalize uh, the general technical report. Um, hopefully, um, uh, folks are, are, are going to provide us the input necessary for us to ultimately make uh, the very best decision for folks in that area. Let me just simply say, however, um, you know, this is a very difficult issue uh, generally, uh, this issue of timber and this issue of timber sales and, and mills. And we have got to figure out ways in which we can increase market opportunity uh, for forest and wood products uh, across the board, uh, whether it's uh, using cross laminated timber to build tall buildings or some other mechanism, because we want to make sure that we maintain the carbon that's stored in those uh, in those trees as opposed to unfortunately and tragically watching too much of it burn up in in, in fires that we've seen that have been historic i think that's well said sir and we know that a managed forest is a healthy forest and uh, I, I like your problem solving approach with the time i've got left i would just note that you're right it's a scientific document i think there's an opportunity for entrepreneurial policymakers like you and me to try to find some different solutions for instance, that scientific report only really analyzes the timber available 
in suitable timberlands, meaning areas that have traditionally been forested or rather been, been harvested. Uh, you know, if we can get your team the resources they need to build additional timber roads, that's going to give us new areas of the forest. That's going to give us new jobs, including for these socially disadvantaged people. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Thank you very much. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal, for five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for participating today. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. In my district, we have over 800 Latino farmers. And I've had the opportunity to speak with some of them about the discriminatory barriers that they face every day, such as language barriers, lack of access to technical assistance, and the need for improved access to land and capital. USDA's Civil Rights Action Team reported in 1997 that Latino farmers were systematically excluded from USDA programs. And in the year 2000, Guadalupe Garcia a group of, and a group of Latino farmers filed a lawsuit similar to the Pickford, and that was ultimately, ultimately settled by the USDA. This lawsuit alleged that discriminatory lending practices by USDA deprive Latino farmers of opportunities afforded to their white counterparts. For example, one of the Latino farmers in this case was denied a loan to buy land by her local FSA office because they claimed that the land didn't have sufficient water to farm it, even though the land in the same area was also being farmed by two white farmers who were financed with FSA operating loans. I would ask for unanimous consent to include in the record the amended complaint in the Garcia lawsuit, Mr. Chair. Done. Without objection? Without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Continuing the current discussion of black farmers, let me ask you this, Secretary Vilsack. In my district, the Natural Resource Conservation District, NRCS, technical assistance, and the expertise of Cooperative Extension Service have proven to be critical to ensuring that the latest science-based practices and the management techniques reach farmers, especially regarding carbon sequestration. In what ways could technical assistance be improved to better benefit black farmers? Well, I think there are a couple of things, Congressman. First of all, I think we need more folks, more boots on the ground. Uh, that's obviously an appropriation issue. I think based on our targets and based on what we think is adequate for servicing the needs of people, we're about 10 to 15 percent below where we need to be with NRCS boots on the ground. So first and foremost, boots on the ground. Secondly, partnerships. We've mentioned this before, the ability to align ourselves with the folks who are trusted uh, in the community to expand our reach, if you will. Uh, that starts with land-grant universities, uh, Hispanic-serving institutions, and uh, other community, community building organizations. Uh, I think it's also, uh, uh, we just recently requested input from folks on the issues of climate uh, through the federal registry. I would encourage you to uh, encourage your stakeholders in your, uh, in your congressional district to respond to the set of questions that we put forward so we get better ideas and better input on how to structure uh, efforts on terms of carbon in the future uh, at USDA. That may also be a way of increasing uh, our understanding of what's necessary and needed on the ground. Thank you, Secretary. I welcome the other witnesses to also weigh in, if you could. Congressman, I think one thing we need to recognize is that we need more diversity within the agency, more people that can relate to the constituents that they serve, more African-American and Latino uh, representatives from NRCS that can go engage with these communities and, and, and have conversations and relate with those audiences. I think that's a big factor and, and, and would help play a big role in continuing the communication and the services that are available to the farmers. And this is Arnetta Cotton. Yeah, I would like to, this is Arnetta Cotton. I would like to add that, that you talked about the language barrier. It's not just, you know, a Latino barrier. It's the whole, all the acronyms used by the government, all of the, the, the different forms that are not, down to the language are the capacity of a, a regular farmer. And then it's the fact that it's the same people in the office 
who was there through Garcia, through Bigford, through all of the others, they have not been let go. So they feel it's okay as if they have the blessing of the agency. And it's a poor representation because the USDA is the people's agency. Thank you. <laughs> also, uh, sure. Congressman, uh, I, I would also like to add to that, if, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I think as a nation, we have to realize that all of our, that all of our challenges have solutions. And it's incumbent upon all of us, the government, our corporations, our organizations, farmers, and all of our citizens to be a part of those solutions. And until we do that, we're going to constantly run around in circles. Farmers need to be educated, but also the USDA. Time of the gentleman has expired. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. I yield back. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, for five minutes. We can expand in five can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Go ahead. Hey, uh, thank you, now. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, it is important that we know the state of, uh, of, 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 our, of our food supply in this nation. And because we're, we're focused on uh, our black farmers in the U.S. Uh, you know, when I grew up, I grew up on a farm, uh, 90 Seven percent, I think, of the population of this country was involved in some way when I grew up in agribusiness, and it's changed quite a bit uh, since uh, since I grew up. I think it's less than two percent of the the people in this country, uh, Mr. Secretary, that are now involved in uh, agriculture. And of course, what happened was, uh, you know, my dad was a dairy farmer with timber and other things. And of course, along comes production ag. And uh, in fact, the milk company was going to finance the expansion of my dad's dairy. Uh, but when my dad looked at the numbers and the, and the fact that he had to put his land on the line, he, he turned them down. And so he went into competition with them and they, and they, they put us out of business. And so, uh, you know, again, we're somewhat of a, a casualty to uh, what's happened in agriculture. Uh, since the 1960s, and I'm sure it's affected uh, folks on this uh, uh, here in this hearing today. And uh, and that's you know it's unfortunate because uh, my dad loved it, but we just couldn't continue on. And obviously, you know, from the standpoint of bringing this nation together, and I understand, you know, the the feelings on both sides. But you know, as people of faith, uh, we. We've got, we, it's not an option that, that, that we come together. In fact, First Samuel, uh, Chairman, this one's for you, because I know every time I get on an airplane, you're reading your Bible. But First Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not a man, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And, and we know uh, the God is an impartial God. So, uh, but we're a fallen world and, and we, we have to deal with it, with our differences. And, uh, but in, you know, in that respect, uh, Secretary Bill said, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to tell you what I've heard floating around out there. And I just want, uh, you know, to get your, uh, find out what, uh, you have seen there, but, uh, the, the American rescue plan includes 4 billion for USDA for loans to disadvantaged farmers. Uh, but uh, in that definition of dis disadvantaged farmers, and again, what we're hearing is like, if, if you want to change in this country, if you decide you want to change your gender, you can change your gender. Uh, is there a possibility that farmers could say, hey, I want to change my race and benefit from this program? Uh, Congressman, I think uh what you're what you're getting to is a very fundamental question, and that is, is whether we trust farmers or don't trust them. Uh, when we had COVID relief, uh, uh, we we trusted farmers uh, when they told us that they were uh, producing corn or soybeans. We we didn't ask them to prove that. We we trusted them, and we sent out billions and billions of dollars. Uh, if you want to create some kind of mechanism that suggests that we're supposed to distrust farmers, well, we could do that. But I, I don't think that's what you want. Certainly not what I want. Uh, we didn't ask for that in CFAP, and, and I don't think we can ask for it in, in this particular situation. The reality is we're going to we're dealing with people that the 
department I, I uh, knows. Think, uh, These sir, are people. I'm not, being arrested. So, I'm not talking about trust. I'm talking about what is the legality of that. Did well, y'all look at the legality of that in this law when you made the law? It, well, it, it, I think it's I, constitutional. I'm not talking about a trust issue here. If it's legal it, to do this, and someone can legally do it, is that possible? Well, first of all, I think the statute is, I think the law is constitutional for the reasons that are articulated earlier. It's tailored, it's focused on a particular set of issues and trying to resolve those issues. And it certainly is dealing with the cumulative impact of discrimination. Uh, so I, but I do think it is a trust issue at the end of the day. Uh, and I think, you know, we're gonna trust folks these are people that have dealt with somebody at the at the FSA office. They've had to make a loan. It's not like these are uh, people that we don't know. We know these people. Um, and the reality is they're going to sign a document that says that they're attesting to the truth of whatever it is they're representing. And there are serious, serious civil and criminal penalties if you don't tell the truth. So I, I for one, I'm, I'm going to trust the farmers uh, to be yeah. truthful. And if they're not, yeah. uh, they're yeah. going to be held accountable. Okay. Well, I just, you know, again... We make these laws, we appropriate money, but uh, from a legality standpoint, and that question was asked to me, uh, and I don't think they were joking. I mean, I, at first I thought it was a joke. And the said, time well, of the gentleman has expired uh, with all respect, Mr. Allen. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Kahana, for five minutes. You may need to unmute, uh, Mr. Kahana. Okay. Uh, Can you hear me, Mr. Hey, Chairman? No. Yeah, we got it. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me just uh, first say how pleased I am uh, to see Secretary Vilsack uh, in, in his role. Uh, he has uh, demonstrated such a commitment uh, in his record of public service to uh, inclusivity, to expanding uh, opportunity uh, to caring about uh, rural America, both uh, black and white rural America. And I uh, have great confidence in, in his leadership and I'm uh, glad that President uh, Biden selected him and that he was willing to come back to Washington. And I also wanna thank uh, uh, Mr. Boyd and for his leadership for decades in uh, bringing issues of equity uh, to the forefront. And really it's a testament, sir, to your leadership uh, and to the chairman's vision that we are having a hearing that is long overdue uh, about uh, basic equity for black farmers. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you spoke eloquently about USDA's long history of discrimination and, and uh, some of the practices. How do you think we can hold some of the local county committees accountable for the bad actors? Uh, there are still some bad actors in some of these local county committees. and. Uh, how do you think we can get the accountability there? Well, uh, I think first and foremost is making sure that those county committees have adequate representation that reflects the population uh, that they serve. And oftentimes, when I was secretary last, we had 385 counties, I believe, that didn't have a minority representative. I appointed uh, minority representatives uh, on those committees. So first of all, there's that. And to the extent that people do provide discrimination. I think the, the point has been well taken. I've taken notes on this. Uh, the reality is if, if we say that discrimination is not to be tolerated and in fact discrimination occurs, uh, then we do need to take disciplinary action. Uh, and, and it needs to be uh, effective and it needs to be forceful and it needs to be uh, relatively quick um, so that people do get the message that this is serious and this is a new day. Uh, and I expect and anticipate that our team will act in that uh, act accordingly. Um, I think it's also uh, the Equity Commission is going to be looking at uh, all aspects of our operation, and I suspect that they will be looking at the structure and the basis and the mechanisms by which uh, decisions have been made and appeals are take place and, and how, that, how that operates, and they may make a set of suggestions and recommendations. Clearly, our internal uh, review of this from our working group, uh, consistent with President Biden's executive order, may also result in recommendations. That process is just getting started. Um, and I want to make sure that that process is able to wor work its way through the process so that we get the very best recommendations. Mr. Secretary, you've spoken to a number of us on this committee about the importance of technology, about the importance of, of broadband, uh, biomanufacturing, precision agriculture. And I wonder uh, 
how you think we can address some of the digital divide uh, in access to technology where uh, the African-American community and black farmers, uh, black uh, rural South has been excluded from a lot of that technology and uh, what can we do to help uh, alleviate that? Well, I think first and foremost, making a true fully funded commitment to expanding access to rural broadband so that in fact, the technology exists. In many communities, it does not exist. Uh, secondly, I think it is working again, as we talked about community building organizations, uh, funding and, and providing the resources, extension, land grant universities, historic black colleges, et cetera, being able to give them the resources that will allow them to do the training uh, so that people understand whether it's a small business person or a, a farmer, how technology can be utilized uh, appropriately. I think it's frankly also uh, basically getting uh, younger people into the United States Department of Agriculture from these areas in the form of internships so that they in turn can go back home and, and with an understanding of how USDA works and what they need in their rural communities and be able to see if, if we can create career opportunities for them at USDA in their local communities to be able to solve some of the problems that they know firsthand. It's a combination of, uh, of that and I'm sure much, much more. No, I appreciate that. I've been surprised in, in just my work how much of our economic development is funded with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I look forward to your leadership on that. Uh, one question uh, for Mr. Boyd and Mr. Blending, and, and, and thank you again for both of your work. Uh, you have correctly testified that black farmers are still impacted by uh, discrimination, and uh, government payouts are uh, linked to production. Uh, black farmers have had less land, are smaller. Uh, because of the historical legacy uh, of racism. How do we then level the playing field, given that uh, black farmers are at this disadvantage because of uh, having less land? Yes, I, I'll take a crack at that first. Uh, first of all, we need to redo the uh, base uh, calculation, the, the way that they're calculated. Uh, and also, uh, we need caps. We need caps so all the money just won't go to the big farmers. We have to figure out a way to do that. During those Trump payouts, uh, uh, there was no sense in having uh, one county, like in Mecklenburg County, receive uh, $40 an acre, and then in uh, Georgia mm -hmm. County, receive $140 an acre. We have to figure out, uh, uh, you know, redo the those- The time of this gentleman, unfortunately, yeah. has expired. <laughs> uh, perhaps, uh, again, Mr. Boyd- I'm trying. They find a way to answer that later on when a question is put to you. What a terrific hearing. I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Balderson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the panel for being here, and I also want to thank uh, Secretary Vilsack uh, for, for joining today and look forward. I'm having a phone call with you next week, but I just want to remind you, and you won't remember me, but I met you with Zach Space. Uh, you were in uh, my hometown of Zanes, Ohio, Muskingum County, when uh, Zach uh, represented us in Congress, and we're kind of doing a nice little tour, and um, you did a you did a really nice job. You're down at the Zanesville Welcome Center, so uh, pretty close to Zach's downtown office here, but uh, look forward to working with you uh, from being that member of Congress now. But And uh, Rep. Uh, Plaska kind of touched on this a little bit, Secretary, but you know, one month after Congress appropriated additional money for the, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or as she referred to it as CFAP, President Biden froze the payments. Can you discuss why the administration suspended CFAP payments and, and what the agency discovered in the nearly two month halt? Uh, it, it's standard practice in changes of administration for the incoming administration to take a look at uh, what may have taken place just before uh, the new administration took over. Uh, and so uh, we wanted the opportunity to basically take a look. We also wanted an opportunity to, to analyze who wasn't being served, who wasn't being helped, uh, who could, who, who wasn't being helped as much as they needed to be. And that's why yesterday we made the announcement, uh, a four-part announcement, uh, pay payments now going under CFAP 2 and CFAP 1 uh, to cattle producers and some of the commodity producers but also uh, resources now for local and regional food system opportunities, as well as uh, a series of steps we're gonna take with roughly $6 billion to help those we've now identified were not served, not helped by previous COVID packages. Uh, we will, over the course of the next several months, be involved in rulemaking to get those resources out the door as quickly as possible. So it was designed primarily to give us a chance to analyze who had been helped, 
and who hadn't been helped and to create and, and construct a, an effort uh, to make sure that we had equitable assistance uh, throughout the COVID. And I will just say, as part of this hearing, it allowed us to identify the fact that in CFAP 2, the outreach to uh, socially disadvantaged producers wasn't what it needed to be. That's why we're going to expand uh, the sign up for 60 days to give people a chance to, to, to apply for those benefits. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I look forward to uh, speaking with you again next week. Um, my next question is for, for the panel, and you all can answer this, and I appreciate all your testimonies that you have given today. Um, but if, if each of you could target one area for the USDA to improve its practices uh, or programs, um, what would that be? And, and let's start with Mr. Boyd, since he kind of gets shut off every time he gets to start talking. So, Mr. Boyd, lead the way. Well, first of all, I would do away with the three-year uh, limitation with requirement for uh, new or beginning farmers. That's the first thing I would do. And I would make sure that uh, we have uh, full participation in uh, farm ownership loans, farm operating loans, all of those areas where uh, black farmers today are pretty much pretty much absent. And uh, the only way to do that is to have oversight uh, and, and transparency. It's something I've been trying to get in this whole hearing and I, and I haven't been able to get it in. We need transparency. So when we have hearings like this, you'll be able to lay out uh, the numbers by state, county, zip code, uh, by race. And when you have people that bring these issues up, you'll be able to go right to those numbers and, and see what they are. That's the way that you uh, improve it. Thank you, sir. Anybody will go ahead and go next. Mr. Haynes or anybody would like to go next. Go ahead. I think the 1 thing that needs to address is the subsidy programs. Uh, John mentioned it earlier, but right now we're seeing 20 cents. For black farmers compared to a dollar for white farmers on these subsidy programs. Uh, that, that's something that really needs to be addressed. And you have black farmers right beside white farmers and they're only getting a quarter on a dollar for what their neighbors are receiving in Arkansas. These programs were established back in the 80s during the crux of discrimination at USDA, and they really need to be addressed. So, so, so that is one issue. The secretary mentioned about the COVID program. You know, one of the benefits of CPAP one were the larger farmers had grain storage and capacities that a lot of small farmers didn't have. So, if you didn't have grain stored in your bins, you weren't able to benefit. A lot of black farmers had to sell their grains in the fall of the year and weren't privileged to storage to benefit. So, so the commodity programs and Congresswoman Bustos from Illinois mentioned it. That is a large pot of money that go out, and and the disparities really start to show themselves when you look at subsidy programs and, and the difference in dollars paid out to, to black farmers and white farmers. Thank you. For if I may, please allow me the opportunity to say that farmers with smaller acreage can't compete with the commodity crops. So we actually have them in co-op. We're organizing cooperatives and we're organizing them to grow and sell into other markets, vegetables and so forth. They need the infrastructure. They can't afford to put in a, a, a facility to wash, dry, cool, and get products to market. It's very important for those small growers, those small landowners to have access to money like this to give them a chance to survive. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I appreciate you all, uh, panelists, this is such an energetic hearing. It is great. It is certainly historic, and yes. I appreciate you all. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Schreier, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to our guests. Uh, th the first issue I want to focus on is land and water access for Black farmers. Our witnesses today have left no doubt that farmers of color have faced and still face systemic barriers to land ownership and water access. And today, Black farmers are more likely to rent rather than own farmland. Uh, they have smaller farms, own less land, generate less wealth uh, from farming compared with white farmers. And these fa factors leave Black farmers at a huge disadvantage um, because farmland real estate represents nearly 80% of total US farm assets. So farmers who do not own land or have a clear title to land can't leverage that land or capital to invest in, sustain, and improve their farming operations. 
Now, this is especially challenging in urban and suburban areas like King and Pierce County in my district. For example, in Washington State in general, the average price for an acre of cropland in 2020 was just over $2,600. But by comparison, in King County, the average price for an acre is uh, more than $35,000. And in Pierce County, it's around $21,500 per acre. So I've heard from farmers of color in, in Washington State about the difficulty in obtaining farmland because of these prices and the historic systems of discrimination that prevent them from ever purchasing farmland. So my question, Dr. Blanding, Mr. Blanding, can you speak about the importance of access to land and actually land ownership for black farmers? And can you talk about what systemic barriers to the purchase and ownership of farmland exists for black farmers today? Yes, thank you. Thank you. That, that question is for Blanding or Board. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, Mr. Blanding. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. Uh, so uh, the problems of black farmers and black, loan, black land ownership is historic. Uh, first, in terms of ownership, uh, getting access to land, first of all, there has to be access to equitable credit in order to get access to that land. And I think uh, there's been systemic problems in the credit industry for years. I think this is an opportunity for there to be a black farmer financial institution modeled after the farm credit system where black farmers can get the kind of credit that they need and serve themselves, just like the farm credit system, which is a great system, by the way. Uh, but again, black farmers need to have access to that type of credit. As a, but our problem is around maintaining and holding on to existing land. Heirs property is a major issue in the black farming community and the black community overall. We estimate 60% of all black land owners have this heirs property issue. And so we must figure out ways to make sure that there's things that can be done to make sure that there's property situation is cleared up. There's things that are already existing, like the heirs property relenting program that was approved for the 2018 farm bill, but is yet to be implemented and funded. Uh, so things like that can be done immediately, but also a lot of education and technical assistance around that area will go a long way to make sure black farmers continue to hold on to their land base and All continue right. to thrive in this country. But I would also like to say, Congresswoman, that we as a country have to look at the value of not only all farmers, but black farmers and specifically around dealing with the issues around land and water, as you suggested, because we're all part of that equation. And you have to make sure that black farmers Thank are part of that as well. I need to, add, to address one more question. Thank you for your comments. I just want to also address black indigenous people of color farmer participation and conservation programs specifically. Among white farmers in Washington state, about 9% receive conservation reserve wetlands reserve farmland farmable wetlands or conservation reserve enhancement program payments for black farmers in washington it's less than one percent so secretary vilsack under your leadership how will the usda work to combat historic and current racial injustices in climate and agriculture policy and how can the usda continue to support existing conservation programs and make them more equitable and accessible well uh, there are several things. Uh, first of all, we're going to ask the current acting uh, chief of the NRCS, Terry Cosby, who's an African American, to help lead that effort to make sure that uh, resources are more equitably available to uh, to socially disadvantaged producers. Uh, secondly, uh, again, the internal review and the external review, uh, whether it's the Equity Commission or the internal review from uh, President Biden's executive order, will obviously identify recommendations. Third, it's about accountability to uh, John Boyd's. Uh, question or, or his comment about transparency. It's about asking for information on an ongoing basis to make sure that you see whether there that whether there is in fact investment being made and if it if there is not, why there is not, and who's responsible for making sure that there is. So it's a combination of a lot of those things. I think it's also a, a combination of working again with, with better outreach. Uh, it may not be that folks uh, don't qualify or it may not be that they're prevented from qualifying, it's that they may not even know about the program. They may not know what they have to do. Uh, and I think this this uh, money in the American Rescue Plan gives us an enormous opportunity to improve outreach and to take a look at additional uh, opportunities to help farmers access more revenue. Uh, I think that's what the market process of the uh, market. The gentleman has expired. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You'll back. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Mann for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question 
is for uh, Mrs. Cotton. Uh, thank you for your incredible service to your community uh, in your written testimony and in our conversation. I know you've mentioned that you helped deliver food to more than a million people in five states during COVID-19 through the USDA's Farmers to Families Food Box Program. What do you foresee as the future for this program and how can the USDA assist with connecting more rural and underserved communities or communities in the last mile um, to get them the food that they need? Thank you, um, Representative Mann. I appreciate that question. Um, it is an excellent program. It's viable and it's much needed. Um, we have people coming, as you know, from five different states to Oklahoma because in their areas, it's not as functional, all right? And so, so what happens, some of the food banks, for a sense of, of, uh, of uh, efficiency, some of the, the dollars were sent to food banks in these last two programs, in the last two phases. By being sent to food banks, then organizations then have to qualify through the food bank in order to be, you know, in order to pick up from them or to be considered a hub. What would make it more viable is if the people who are actually getting the work done in integrity, there have been people who have taken advantage of the system, uh, but who are operating in integrity and getting the food out to the people where they belong, uh, I believe that it will continue to be a good program. As far as the last mile is concerned, it is it goes back to transparency and accountability. If those uh, vendors were awarded monies that included last mile delivery. So if from me, I'm sending out to different places, then from me, then that person who is doing that work, networking with other people should get that last mile. Um, and so how do we continue to do so? By percentages. It's documentable. They know how many trucks that they are delivering. They know where the trucks are going. They know how much is being disseminated and what's not being returned to them. That's that's an easy, easy fix. By allowing some of the uh, cold storage, uh, which they have had refrigerated trucks, if they would allow some of the cold storage to include thermal blankets. So in some of the really, because our community, communities are so rural, they can't afford to get a semi truck. So if they would allow uh, thermal blankets to suffice in cold storage, we'd be able to get it out quicker. And if they would underwrite the cost of providing those blankets to individuals who are picking up and then taking to other people. Our community is less than 2000. And so there are a lot of seniors who are homebound and we need that service. We actually do, but it is wonderful. And That's some perfect. of our volunteers, I would say that too. Our community yeah. has yeah. come together. Yeah. You don't feed a million people or half of them as we had a lot of volunteers. So no, th right. thank you for that. Um, um, the second question, this one is for uh, Mr. Haney. Mr. Haney, in your testimony, you mentioned that you have formed partnerships with land-grant universities. We all know that land-grant universities play an important role in educating our next generation of farmers. Can you talk more about your partnership with these land-grant universities and how they have helped? Well, I mentioned partnerships with corporations and in our local and state agencies. Uh, but but with, we have relationships with the land grant universities where we have National Black Growers Council has a field day uh, strategy. And we want to work with those land grant universities to bring the, the, the agriculture community, who's typically not serviced, they, they can come out and see the latest and greatest that agriculture has to offer. So what corporations have to offer as far as seed and chemistry and technology, uh, these these communities are often not served by the salesman who would typically go to the white farmer who's the larger spend and the bigger accounts. Uh, they, they take all this information there. And, and oftentimes they drive right past the driveways where black farmers exist. So we wanted to make sure that we were a conduit and a pipeline for information for the black farm community to be aware of everything that's available in production agriculture. Th thank you. Uh, thank, thank you both. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you very much. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Kirkpatrick, for five minutes. Well, good afternoon from Arizona. Thank you, Chairman Scott, for bringing us together with this panel on such an important topic. 
I grew up in the White Mountain Apache Reservation in rural Arizona and was raised in a ranching family. So I know just how important these USDA programs are for farming and ranching families. In my state of Arizona, there are more Native American farmers than any other state. And I wanna mention the unique challenges they face in getting access to USDA programs. Just as Ayers property created a barrier for black farmers getting financial uh, aid from farm loans, Native American farmers have also struggled to participate in USDA programs due to the nature of land ownership of Indian trust lands. For Native American farmers, historical program rules requiring land ownership for eligibility have prevented them from accessing the assistance they need to develop their land. So a common thread in all of the testimony today is that these obstacles create systemic inequity. Not surprisingly, due to these systemic inequities, white farmers are 70% more profitable than Native American farms, despite Native American farms being over twice the size. So first, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include in the record a 2019 report by the GAO describing the needs and barriers to agriculture lending on tribal land. It's done without objection. Thank you so much. So my first question is for Mrs. Sherrod. Uh, I'm moved by your testimony and I'm so sorry to hear about this grand, grim anniversary of your father's death and it saddens me to hear that you never received justice in your father's case. I'm also very troubled by the problems you detailed that still plague the USDA today and continue a cycle of inequity. So here's my question. Can you describe some things that the USDA can do to improve its outreach to black farmers? And what are the main barriers to black farmers accessing USDA programs? Let me say that working with community-based organizations, we are on the ground. We've been working with them to help change their situations in spite of all the, the issues they face with USDA. So I think it's very important. That's why we fought for Section 2501 way back in the 90s to try to get funds specifically targeted to minority farmers and uh, through community-based organizations and 1890 land grants. That program is now serving everybody. They've thrown the kitchen sink toward that program. So uh, black farmers are not getting the benefit of something we fought so hard to get past. Um, the, there are so many very different bar, uh, barriers now because people have been kept out of the agency. You got to make them feel they can come back there for help. And that can happen if you work with people on the ground who are working with them. We, you know, USDA is there, but they need us, you know, and we can help turn that around, but we can't get the funding to do it. They... They do indeed need you, need you. so uh, thank, thank you for recognizing that. My, my second question is for Mr. Rao. Uh, I'm inspired by your testimony today and by your decision to become a first generation farmer. Further, I can only imagine the difficulty in not only starting a farm completely from scratch, but going through the process to ensure you're producing organic crops. From my conversations with farmers back home, I know that going through the org organic certification process is something that scares a lot of farmers off or they don't know where to start, even if they are already operating under USDA organic practices. Can you describe for us some of the reasons you chose to produce organically? And if you see an opportunity to help more black farms through the USDA organic certification. Uh, yes, sir. 
I'm going to have to ask if you might be kind enough to reply in writing. We're way past the time. I deeply appreciate your consideration. We want to get every member in this important hearing. So now I recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Frenstra, for five minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman Scott and Ranking Member uh, Thompson. Uh, first, I just want to thank each of the witnesses for their testimony today and sharing the experiences you, your family, and your friends have faced. Um, I, I appreciate uh, that you uh, saying these things, and I also definitely appreciate Mr. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Bill Saka, uh, for being here today. Um, he is from my home state, and I, I uh, appreciate that. Um, Ms. Cotton, uh, in your testimony, you speak to the importance of local community organizations in relaying USDA resources. Can you expand on how USDA could better engage with community organizations and non-governmental organizations to conduct outreach and to implement USDA training programs? Uh, absolutely, we have land grant. Thank you so very much for that question and for the opportunity. We have land grant universities here in Oklahoma through which, uh, as uh, Ms. Sherrod just talked about the 2501 programs, we, we have that available to us that we can partner with the USDA. They are educational institutions and they are established as minorities. Um, and so it would be wonderful if through those uh, universities programs with existing community outreach programs, uh, they would partner together in order to be the hands and feet or rather the boots on the ground for the people in the communities. They are big enough to uh, partner with the USDA offices in all of their branches, FSA, NRCS, RD, uh, in order to talk to the people in their language, kind of break it down, break it down from what the government expects, you know, break it down to its simplest denomination so everyone can understand it. And then they be there to help walk the people through all the technical, giving technical advice without coming back and saying, yes, you did it right. Let's follow up on that. Let's follow through to see that it was successful are two different things. With the, By partnering with the USDA and the land grant universities, we can do that. They can absolutely create educational programs that can go out to the field and then be applied to those in the community. I, I appreciate that, Ms. Cotton. And so I, I'm just curious. So in Iowa, we have the ex, uh, Iowa Extension Service uh, that does some of this, that, that sort of works together. I, I didn't know if the Extension Service is, is available in your area or not. Uh, this is pretty big for, for our area, for our farmers. And I find it, I'm a local farmer here. Uh, my family is, and we use that Extension Service a lot. Uh, the Extension Services are available to us. Uh, OSU extension is available to us in the area, but when it comes to combining the two programs, you know, they, they uh, focus more on the agricultural side, actually the agricultural side, but the implementation of USDA programs needs the partnerships, primarily with land grant universities that are historically underserved. Yep, yep. No, I, I appreciate your comments. I agree 100% with you. and. You know, I, I would love to work with, with the chairman and, and things like that on trying to figure out how that partnership can occur. Um, I have a land grant university in my uh, in my state, also at Iowa State University, and you know they're very big into agriculture and trying to figure out how we can help um, one another and 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 you know continue uh, to expand and and especially in diversity. So, thank thank you so much uh, for your comments, and uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Sanford Bishop, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank you so very much for holding this historic hearing on the state of black farmers in the United States. Uh, let me thank you for bringing together such a tremendous panel uh, to help us understand how we can bring equity to black farmers. 
Uh, let me thank uh, especially Secretary Vilsack uh, for his commitment uh, to bringing equity. Uh, I want to also uh, thank uh, him for his uh, efforts to reconcile uh, with uh, Ms. Sherrod, who was once uh, in the last administration uh, where he was secretary, uh, rural development for Georgia. Uh, I want to welcome uh, the other witnesses from Georgia with whom I have worked, uh, and I'm so delighted that they were able to, uh, to testify. And for Ms. Cotton and Reverend Cotton, I want to uh, welcome you, and uh, I'm delighted to meet you. Uh, let me uh, uh, go back to uh, what was just raised with regard to outreach uh, and advocacy. Uh, one of the tremendous needs uh, for uh, black farmers to be able to fully uh, access the resources of USDA uh, is to know what resources are available and how to get to them. Uh, advocacy and outreach uh, is extremely important. Uh, and of course, the Office of Partnerships and Engagements uh, is performing that function. And I think under the previous uh, 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 Vilsack administration, the uh, advocacy and outreach uh, function uh, uh, was performed there. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, to bring together the 1890s, the land grants, uh, the community-based programs, the 2501 programs, you need to have within uh, USDA uh, a focused office uh, whose uh, sole responsibility is to make sure that that outreach happens in each and every sub-agency of USDA, farm service, rural development, uh, housing, utilities, NRCS, marketing, the export opportunity, research, uh, and the opportunity to develop uh, uh, young farmers. Uh, the uh, 1890s National Scholars Program, for example, the internship programs, all of these things are vitally important, but somebody at USDA, and right now I think it's being done by the Office of Partnerships and Engagement, but I'm, I want to ask, ask the Secretary if he can assure us, and I, I congratulate him on uh, uh, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Hashkin, who we hope will soon be confirmed, uh, to work with him to make this happen. Uh, can you comment on that briefly, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary? And then I'd like to, uh, if you could be brief on that, uh, to ask Ms. Sherrod and Ms. Cotton uh, to comment on the impact and the experience that they have had as black women farmers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the question. The answer, the quick answer is yes. And we know this works uh, because of an advice that Shirley Sherrod gave me in my last time at uh, USDA, we did create the Strike Force initiative that she made reference to. It ended up operating in over 20 states and made over 200,000 investments. This system works. We need more of it. And I want to add that as a, as a female um, in the field of agriculture, working with farmers and farming, um, we, um, we, we make major contributions, just let me say, say that and i've you know i've gone from having to sit down with a farmer and help him understand what it meant to change for example if i go back years from the old allotment program with peanuts to uh the the um the well i won't go back that far but farmers are focused on farming women focus on the business as well and when you put those together we can make progress. We also plan and, and developing cooperatives and looking at markets and, and helping our farmers to transition from row crops when they don't have enough land. We make those contributions to this work that no one really recognizes. And let me add to that. Uh, in addition to all of that, we do the actual work. Uh, haul the hay, fix the fence, work the cows, uh, but when we go into the offices, I've had to even prove I'm four foot eleven, you all, and I've had to go in and show video of me staging hay because they said there was no way that I could do it. That's so it, it gets the time of, uh, gentleman uh, Bishop has expired.
Uh, thank you very much. Now I recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Miss Fishback, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity, and I thank all of the testifiers uh, for being here today. It's been a very, very interesting, and I just had to have a, a couple of questions for uh, the secretary. Um, you know, just uh, I, I've heard a couple of the testifiers mention, you know, passing on the farm and uh, several generations worth of farming. And Mr. Secretary, the uh, the Biden administration um, has been talking about potentially making some changes to the calculation of the stepped up basis. And I'm wondering if you could maybe comment on that, on how that might affect some of these folks that are trying to pass on farms, particularly um, in the socially disadvantaged communities. Uh, Congresswoman, I have not had an opportunity to visit with anyone in the Biden administration on the issue of stepped up basis. Uh, I do know that it is uh, an important uh, aspect of uh, the countryside where people who uh, pass away the appreciation of their uh, farmland uh, is essentially not taxed, not subject to income tax, uh, and it op opportunity it provides an opportunity for transfer uh, to the next generation. Um, I, I'm happy to look into that issue uh, and find out more about it, but I, I, I'm sorry to say I'm not prepared to to respond to that question today. I didn't anticipate that one. Well, and, and Mr. Secretary, I appreciate that. Um, I, I just as like I said, as we were talking. As some of the testifiers were talking a little bit about those generational farms, and so I just thought that that might be something that uh, would be of concern. But, uh, Mr. Secretary, just one other thing: uh, uh, Congressman Bishop was talking a little bit about some of the outreach, and um, I was just kind of wondering if maybe you could expand a little bit on some of that and uh, um, what kind of outreach is being done on some of the existing programs to make sure. In particular, are those that younger generation of farmers, but you know, um, it, with an emphasis on the on these uh, on those groups in the socially disadvantaged communities. Well, obviously, COVID has made somewhat of a uh, somewhat of a different uh, situation over the last year, uh, but but uh, historically, uh, the you know, I think that these folks, the panelists, have basically put their finger on the real problem here, which is that it's very very hard for farmers to initiate the conversation. That leads to uh, providing the technical assistance and outreach if you don't trust the people that you are asking for help. Uh, and that is the fundamental issue here, uh, one of the fundamental issues. We have got to restore trust out in the countryside. And frankly, we can't do that, in my estimation. We can't do that by walking in uh, to or walking on the farm and saying, uh, as we say, hi, I'm here from the government, I'm here to help you. Uh, we have got to walk on the farm with someone who they trust. A community building organization, uh, a, a land grant university extension, whatever it might be, and basically say, we are here to listen. We're here to learn how we can help you. And then there has to be a commitment to make it a successful relationship and transaction. Uh, it can't be just we listen and then we give you 15 reasons why 